Jim, we'll go ahead and uh, get called back to order here. We'll start with the afternoon portion of our uh, meeting. So uh, we had a little bit of a BLM topic there at the end um, of the uh, morning. And now we'll uh, go on to a wild horse update. Uh, first up, we have our uh, friends from the BLM. Uh, welcome back to the Select Federal Natural Resource Management Committee. Uh, please uh, introduce yourselves, tell us who you are, your uh, official title, and uh, for the record, and then proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon, I'm Chris Kirby. I'm the Associate State Director of BLM Wyoming. Thank you for having us. And we apologize for missing the earlier session. We had a, an earlier agenda and we didn't know that that was happening. So apologize, we weren't here to hear the testimony. So that was something that's basically going in the rulemaking process right now. We, uh, yes, intentionally did not invite you since it wasn't uh, anything that's been implemented yet. Uh, we might have a follow-up. It's about the conservation leases I'm sure you've heard about. In the um, we'll have follow up, I'm sure, once we uh, have a better idea of how that's going to proceed. But we just wanted to hear from our uh, congressional delegation and uh, some of the affected, potentially affected industry groups. And uh, so you're not, uh, you, you, that was intentional, don't worry. And okay, uh, that we, makes we don't want to put you on the spot with something that was, uh, at this point, kind of, we don't know exactly how it's going to play out. So, anyways, Thank you. so anyways, pr please proceed. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm Brad Purdy. I'm the Deputy State Director of Communications for the BLM Wyoming State Office. All right, Mr. Chairman and members of the Select Federal Natural Resource Management Committee, I appreciate the invitation to appear before you today to provide information about several different BLM Wyoming programs and efforts. We'll start out with Wild Horses and Burrows. Under the Wild Free Roaming Horses and Burrows Act of 1971, Wild Horses, the goal of the act is to protect wild horses and burrows as integral parts of thriving natural ecosystems in balance with other public resources. In Wyoming, there are currently 16 herd management areas, known as HMAs, on nearly 5 million acres. Four of the 16 HMAs overlap the checkerboard land pattern of alternating private and public lands in the southwestern part of the state. As many of you know, BLM Wyoming released the Rock Springs and Rollins Wild Horse and Burrow Record of Decision in early May. That decision is currently under litigation, and it would change the management of wild horses to address concerns related to managing horses within those checkerboard areas if upheld. Specifically, the Great Divide Basin and Saltwell, Saltwells Creek HMAs would revert to herd areas managed for zero wild horses. The portion of the Adobe Town herd management area located within the Rock Springs field office would also revert to a herd area managed for zero wild horses, while the portion in the Rollins field office would continue to be an HMA with a reduced appropriate management level of between 259 and 536 horses. It's also important to keep in mind that the current Rock Springs and Rollins Wild Horse and Burrow Record of Decision is a land allocation decision and does not authorize any on the ground activities or gathers in those HMAs. The BLM currently estimates there are approximately 8,181 wild horses on the range in Wyoming. This is significantly higher than the high appropriate management level of 3,725 that our, our HMAs can support. The BLM has two gathers tentatively scheduled for October 2023, the McCullough Peaks Bait Trap Gather and the Northlander Helicopter Gather. If both gathers occur, the BLM estimates that up to 2,600 horses could be removed from Wyoming HMAs. This determination is based on funding availability and the BLM anticipates funding levels that will challenge our ability to maximize our gather, removal, and fertility control efforts. The BLM placed over 7,700 wild horses and burrows into private care through adoptions and sales last year nationwide. Despite aggressive management and record-setting years for gathers and private care placement, the BLM again faces funding, legal, and political constraints that limit our ability to implement the full scope of the Wild Free Roaming Horses and Burrows Act. We look forward to working with partners on this shared challenge. Thank you. Uh, do you have anything, Mr. Purdy? Or you get, okay, any questions? Very good. Any questions for the BLM? Any, any questions on wild horses? Parallels. Chairman, we have um, me meeting materials in our packet. Um, I'm wondering, is this were these documents provided by the BLM? I just don't know who gave us this info that's in our packet. Um, 
Um, the Wyoming Stock Growers Association provided the materials that are in your packet, so they don't they didn't submit any materials. Okay. Any questions for the BLM? Go ahead, Representative Hunter. Mr. Chair, you mentioned that there were some some political headwinds to to wild horse management. Could you elaborate a little bit of, uh, on what political headwinds you had do have? some of the things that you that are impeding this? Thank you, Representative Heiner. So, I mean, obviously funding is a challenge and so that funding is never not political, right? So getting the funding to do the gathers is a challenge. And part of, part of the issue is it's not just going out and doing the gather because once we gather the horses, we have to have somewhere to hold them. So our holding facilities kind of across our system are not always sufficient to hold as many horses as we bring in. For example, recently in Wheatland, you know, we brought in quite a few more horses than we thought we were going to bring in. They ended up putting that many horses together. We got strangles. The whole corral was quarantined for over a year, meaning we couldn't move any horses. And that's a huge facility. And if we can't move horses out of that facility and it's pretty much full, then we can't do other gathers. So that's kind of one of our, the funding challenges is, is that there's not a larger understanding that it's not just the gather doesn't happen in a vacuum. You know, we have to have all the holding and transportation and everything else. We've learned from our counterparts in Eastern states, they can probably get a lot of our horses adopted out and move them, but we first have to hold them, transport them, et cetera. So I know Horse and Burrow Program Lead, she's working really hard with our appropriators to help them understand that, you know, this is, we don't just fund a gather, we don't just fund a holding facility. This is a comprehensive holistic system. So that's been challenging because people don't always understand that. And they might just want to fund a gather or fund a holding facility, but not both and not fund the system, the, the systemic approach. The other, the other piece is it's a it's a very you know, it can be a very controversial topic. And there, there are many people that at times take a stand against us doing gather. So that's, that's a lesser, that's a lesser headwind, but there are political headwinds because people feel very passionately about wild horses and burrows on all sides of all sides of the spectrum. So at times that's when we can manage, but at times it can create some challenges for us that maybe we have to divert and work with other groups to just help work, the, help them understand the process and get us. You know, adoptions are the sort of the third leg there. Right? If we can adopt horses that gets them off uh, gets them out of the holding facilities, opens up more space for holding, which allows us to, of course, do gathers. But it's funding, it's holding, uh, it's all sort of linked together. Um, you know, and I think uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had a nice meeting with some of our contracting officers uh, across across the country. We had some solicitors out. Uh, we were able to tour some wild horse uh, HMAs. Uh, good conversation and helping folks understand how everything's linked together. And, and how important it is if we're going to remove horses uh, that's required by the act, we need these other aspects of the program uh, to be healthy and working well. Mr. Chairman, uh, I, uh, I read somewhere that you were closing, the, temporarily closing down the holding facility here in Rock Springs to do some upgrades or maintenance or something like that. How long would that be closed and what would you do with the animals when you do close a holding facility such as this for a certain amount of time? Yeah, thank you, Representative Heiner, for that question. We, I believe we are reopening the facility for adoptions in October. We can get you that information for sure. And the horses are still there. So they're, they're still being cared for. They're still being taken care of. We just, um, obviously, we didn't want the public while we we're out doing construction and doing upgrades. It wasn't safe to have the public out there, but the horses are still out there. We can get you, um, I, I believe it's October, but we'll make sure we get you the, the month when that's reopening to the public. You know, of course, even though we might not be doing in-person adoptions, those horses are still going to be available on the online corral. So adoptions are continuing. So there's ability to pick up, ship, things like that. So uh, it's not like when we had the strangles where we had to quarantine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a general question. When was the last time you met the AML numbers? How many years ago was this? Uh, Senator Kolb, thank you for that question, and we are going to have to get back to you on that. I do not know, but it's, I mean, I'm smiling because it's an excellent question. I think it's been a while, but we'd like to get you better details on that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we just, I just came from a travel recreation wildlife committee meeting, and we talked about um, just the harsh winter and what that meant for a lot of antelope populations. Um, were wild horses at all impacted by the unusual snowstorm? I mean, did you see some more mortality and fatality out there or 
can just tell us how they, they did this winter. Thank you, Senator Ellis. We don't have, we only have anecdotal data right now. We don't have actual population data or anything statistically. We are not seeing the same level of mortality though that a lot of the ungulates in the state experienced. So, but again, that's very, very anecdotal and we haven't been out doing surveys and population counts yet. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my question, I have lots of questions, but um, do you folks really think that this um, adopt horse program is the answer? Or are we at on it today as far as demand and ability to send them that direction? Thank you, Representative Winner. Appreciate that question. I mean, as you know, the adopt the adoption program is part of the Wild Horse and Burrows Act of 1971. It is it is a very successful program. Um, this year, out of the Wheatland facility, for example, we were able to start doing adoptions again in April. We're trying to move 930 horses out of there. We've already moved 500 horses out. We're really finding a lot of success through the online corral. When we have our adoption events, they're really great and they're really great um, public relations events. But we're only adopting out about five to eight horses at those. Um, we've moved quite a few, we've moved a few hundred through the online corral. So we are having a lot of success because there is demand in the Eastern states for these horses, if we can move them across. So for us in the Wild Horse and Burrows Act, and we are seeing really good success with it. There's our national programs being really creative, trying to think about, again, modern ways to start moving these horses, you know, the online corral, other ways to get people like not just, you know, locally to learn about what's available, what horses are available, where, and how we can get them moved to their location. Even if they're in Florida or Maine, they can get horses from Wyoming. So we do, we do fully support the program. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you mentioned you have two uh, roundups scheduled for 2023. Is that correct? I'm having trouble hearing you folks. And I, uh, but uh, I've, I've been hearing stories about uh, the BLM requiring that we, uh, or you, you turn back so many horses uh, after a roundup or during the, a roundup, if you will. And uh, so I'd just like to get some clarity on that as to what your policy is. And um, if you think you can I mean, it says here you got 56,000. Well, that's that's just nationally. But uh, in the state, we have what? Um, anyway, there's lots of horses out there over and above the mm -hmm. AMLs. And uh, do you think, when do you think you can get them reduced down to where they're going to, it's going to be a, a, a decent management uh, method? Thank you for the question. So we, so the two gatherers planned for this winter, they're tentative as of right now. We have not secured funding for those yet, but they are the second and third highest priority in the entire, in all of BLM. Um, so we're hoping to secure funding for that. There, I don't have an answer for you as to when we think we can get ourselves down, get all the herd management areas down to AML. It will depend on funding. There is a national push, a larger push to get supplemental funding for this program from Congress for the BLM across the whole nation to start gathering 20,000 horses per year. And they think that will, over the course of 10 years, that will get us down to AML nationwide. Obviously we haven't received the funding for that yet. I'm seeing you smile. We haven't received the funding for that yet. That is the larger goal though. That will take a lot more capacity than we have. So the funding will have to include probably a strike team that goes around supports gathers, et cetera. So I don't have an answer for when in Wyoming we can get ourselves down to AML, but these two gathers will start to get us down that road if, if we get funding for them this coming winter. Thank you. Um, so what you're telling me is that if, if you don't, um, get them adopted, then you're going to put them out onto a pasture or a holding facility of some kind somewhere. Is, um, so you think that's the, the answer to the problem? 
and thank you again for the question. I mean, we we are required to follow the law. And so, you know, the law allows horses that are 10 years older, there's a different program that they go under kind of the, if they're, you know, put up for adoption three times, there's a different program they can go under, but all the horses under 10 years old, we are required to continue to try to get them into permanent homes off site, off of BLM facilities. So we, that is, that is the answer and the tool that we have before us. Do you have anything to add on that? No, I mean, you know, horses can go, you know, obviously with what's best for the taxpayer is we find the horse, the, the horse that's happy home there. Uh, obviously, you know, if they age out or, or strike out, uh, if they go to three different um, adoptions, they can strike out and then they go to long-term holding. Uh, I think that's, you know, less optimal. Um, but, you know, that's the other way uh, that the horses come out of facilities like Wheatland, which is a more of a short-term holding facility. They go to eco sanctuaries. A lot of those are located in the Midwest. Um, but really what's, what's best for the American taxpayer is somebody adopts the horse. Uh, you know, we've got other, you know, other programs. We work with uh, some, you know, local law enforcement, uh, some of the larger horses that come off of, a, of an HMA. Uh, when we were up at the Mantle Ranch, uh, I saw one that the Mantles were working uh, to, I think, send to the Forest Service. Um, so again, uh, you know, I saw a video several years ago where there was a wild horse in New York City. Uh, these are some of the other programs that we try, uh, you know, to find a place for these horses to go. So, um, is your uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is it still costing? at least $77 million a year to hold these horses? Or is it more or less now? Representative Winner, we can get you that information. I don't have that data nationwide, what it's costing us to hold them unless you have it. Yeah, we, we can get you that information. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a, a, a question. I, I've known about, uh, of course, this issue for how, since the 80s when I first became aware of it. What do you do to land the private landowners that your horses are basically trespassing on their land? I, I realize they're wild animals. How do you compensate them for the damage they caused? I mean, is there a compensation program that you give any money back to people that you, through your, I'll just say it, mismanagement of these wild horses cause other people's impacts? Is there a program is there anything that they, they get any compensation for this damage that I guess we always talk about? Senator Kolb, thank you for that good question. I don't, I'm not aware of one, but we can follow up and, and find out. I don't, I don't have the information on that. And a, a follow-up uh, observation from my short time on this planet. Uh, those facilities you got out here, the ones in town with the corrals, uh, Throughout the years, they've exploded. I mean, it used to be a small facility. I used to drive by it and look at it. And I drove by it, and I'm astounded. Uh, this is a regular feedlot you got going on over there now, right, with all sorts of animals all, all over the place. I mean, I hear this funding, right? You have a funding problem. But nobody gets their arms around this problem. You, you, you kind of try to nibble at the edges, but as you do that, the horse's population explodes, right? So are you got are your hands tied? I mean, I realize you're not the people in Washington making the decisions, but are your hands physically? I'd like to hear the truth, the truth of this. Are, are your hands as physically tried? You're just doing what you can with what you have, because it's not working for us. I mean, this problem's getting bigger, and it's the same problem we've had for how many years now? I don't know, decades. I guess I don't have an answer. The last time we had the AML uh, numbers met, but what could you? expound on i guess your your challenges besides money i mean thank you thank you senator kolb well as you're as you're probably aware wild horses do really well in this environment um we've learned they double their population every four years and you're exactly right we you know it's hard for us to stay on top of that and stay ahead of that and keep ourselves keep you know the the hmas within AML. That being said, and, and I'll kind of break it into two things. The the reason, part of the reason the holding facilities have gotten so much bigger is we are trying to get more horses off the range. And so in order to do that, like I said, it's that holistic system. We have to have a place to put 
them. So if we're going after large gathers, which I think in the last gather, we got how many more horses than we thought we were going to get? Yeah, in the Rock, the Rock Springs gather. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, we gathered 3,500. Well, we gathered 4,200, uh, removed 3,500. Uh, the ones that we put back, uh, you know, obviously mares get PZP. We did a couple uh, IUDs as part of a study. Um, so, you know, uh, so the, the amount we gather is not the amount that we remove. Because I think we were planning on gathering 2,000 for that one, and we... No, it was always 3,500. Oh, it was? Yeah, okay, yeah. okay. I thought we had uh, way more. We than... were... So... Yeah, we were over... I mean, that was the, the most recent one we did um, right here, right outside of Rock Springs. Um, so, so yeah, so we, we are, in order to move that many horses, we're so, so much over AML in order to move that many horses. We have to hold that many horses. The holding is this, this big key in the middle. Like you said, it's these facilities have expanded greatly. And then the, the example at Wheatland is we had so many horses at one point from different parts of the range put into one facilities. And so as the strangles went rampant, we kept trying to build wheels to spread them out, to stop it or slow it down. I mean, it took us a year to get that facility out of quarantine due to strangles because we obviously can't move horses with strangles. So that's part of why you're seeing these larger facilities is we're, we're having more and more horses together. I think that goes back to the earlier statement I was making. This is why, you know, BLM headquarters has realized we've got to do something like there's got to be a serious focus on this, get us this funding to try and move 20,000 horses a year off the range, because that's what they've calculated can actually get us to get us to AML in about 10 years across the, across the whole BLM complex, not just Wyoming. So that's the larger political force that they're trying to, they're trying to put together a larger program to get us funding, to have a 10 year program to do that. And you're right. I don't have any control over that. We provide data for them, but our, as far as our hands are tied, we can do what we have with the budget we're given every year. And so, I mean, these gathers are very expensive. We can't contract with someone unless we can pay them. We need to have our wild horse and burrow specialists and our staff out there. So we would, that's why we're really hoping for the funding for both these gathers this fall, because we're, our staff are already gearing up in both field offices to be ready to do it and be ready to um, start going as soon as we get the funding and the word that we can start. But I mean, that we can only do what we have the staffing and funding to accomplish. There's no, there's no political telling us not to do this. We really realize it's. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I want to say something, one thing positive, that I have seen a reduction in the wild horses around here, top of White Mountain, backside of White. There has been a noticeable reduction. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're not, maybe the feed's not up here now. I'm not sure, but they're a noticeable reduction. Mm -hmm. But on a, a more negative note, uh, you guys, uh, I wouldn't want you flying on an airplane because you're behind the power curve. It crashed. If we keep on trying to, I don't know, manage from behind, they they just out they out produce it, out reproduce us. Mm -hmm. but we got to get in front of this. I mean, skirt. It's just it's just not working. How's that sound? You're our partners. We need you. What you're doing doesn't work. Please come up with a plan. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Questioner, but go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, a little bit of a follow-up on that. It kind of sounds like you can't do anything. Uh, and maybe I'm, maybe I'm not understanding this. Uh, so you guys don't have the funding. You don't have nowhere to go with horses. Adoption of 20,000 horses a year. Uh-huh. Good luck with that. Uh, so these facilities are just going to continue to grow. There's another question. Uh, so we're not going to fix the problem. They're going to outbreed us, outgrow us. Our facilities are going to out, just continue to grow. You guys are going to continue to be short on money, short on capital. Uh, are you guys not allowed to go to the glue factory? Uh, is that not part of the, okay. So your hands are literally tied. You're going to the fight and your hands are tied behind your back. There's no winning here. We have to, is there, do you, can you even come up with a strategy to win this battle at the way it's set up currently? Thank you. Thanks, Representative Tarver. I appreciate that question. Tools that we are provided, you know, and so we have to follow the law and the law does not allow us to um, send horses to commercial facilities for processing. And so we are, we are using the tools that are provided to us, you know, and so we, we are required, as you are aware, to work within the framework of the law. So I appreciate your question. Thank you. I'll just a real quick follow-up. You know, Youth in Asia is in the Wild Horse and Burrow Act of 1971. That was that's in there on on DOI BLM's budget for as long as I've worked for the Bureau, and that's been around 15 years now. 
Um, so that is not an option that's currently on the table. And just to be clear with that, it's right. you can't get somebody else to do it just because you don't have the funding. When Congress puts a rider on it, that means it's not you're not going to do it. Period. You're not going to facilitate it anyway, right? That's correct. Yes. Okay. All right. Go ahead. You have a follow up, Representative. You good? Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. I, there's a picture out here on the wall of some wild horses out uh, wild running, and it looks be very beautiful. And we, you, your heart goes out to these animals. The, the key word is wild. And I think that's what the perception that most people have of our wild, wild horses, that this is beautiful and we want to maintain that. And, and I agree. I love to see the wild horses. But then I've, I've been by some of these holding facilities, and I've seen the horses in the holding facilities. It's, it's crowded. The key word still is a wild horse that's been permanent. Do you feel like this is uh, the humane thing to do to take them up in a very tight, overcrowded facility for the rest of their natural life? Thank you for that question. The, you know, the act requires, and again, you know, we're, we have to operate within the framework of the law and the tools that were provided. And the act does require us to gather horses that are over the AML. We are our contractors that manage these facilities are required to provide humane conditions. They are required to provide veterinary care, farrier care. They, they are required to provide conditions that are conducive to the horses, you know, not getting sick, not, not being injured by the conditions that we provide. And so that's why, again, at Wheatland, when we had so many more horses and we thought we made a bigger, we made, you know, we kept adding wheels and made a larger facility so we could spread them out more. We realized that, yes, running in that wedge on the wheel, are, we are requiring our contractors to manage these horses in a humane way and care for them. And we do follow up with inspections and welfare inspections to ensure that's occurring. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I had the opportunity of touring our, the Honor Farm up in Riverton, where a lot of the wild horses come through and they're, they're green broke. Their adopt, uh, fabulous program, and not only helps the horses to get adopted, but also helps our, our Honor Farm uh, attendees to be able to do something productive and stay busy. So it's a huge win-win on both sides. Mm -hmm. To expand upon that program at that Honor Farm, or other other fac facilities throughout the country to be able to utilize talents and adoption rates out there for these wild horses. Thank you, Representative Heiner. We actually were just at the 35th anniversary adoption event at the Honor Farm. It was fantastic. And as Mr. Purdy mentioned, we actually took the contracting officers and solicitors there so they could understand the value and benefit of that program. And as you say, um, see the success rate. I mean, you know, people bidding on horses, bidding them up and the string of burrows coming out, those getting bid up higher than some of the horses. So it was a really incredible event. And I think help them understand why and how that partnership is so important to us. I think we're willing to consider, you know, if the, if that organization wants to increase their, their ability, their staffing capacity, right. Cause they're limited to, we're willing to consider options that are put on the table. I mean, you know, Oper operation such as that is such a great um, a public relations piece for the Wild Horse and Burrow program. And what a great, like you said, a win-win. These gentlemen that get to go there and, you know, maybe instead of staying in the system, get to be rehabbed and put out into society, you know, and having actual life skills that they can go then use and, and find a career and a profession possibly. So we we fully support that the Honor Farm and I think in, endorse any type of model that exists. And there, there, there are probably others in other states. I'm not, a, I'm not familiar with them, but I'm sure we have other similar models in other states but the BLM absolutely supports those. It, it's a great, it's a really great, like I said, public relations piece for our team. And that's why we made sure we took the people from the contracting shop and the solicitors there who sit in Denver, right? And don't know what these things are. We took them up to Riverton and really showed them, this is what this is. And this is what this means to the people here, the local community, the inmates here, and, and to, you know, the state of Wyoming and to BLM. I'm really glad you highlighted that. On similar lines, you know, we had some discussion previously about uh, some, you know, different types of fertility control. There's even, uh, you know, third parties are willing to go out and, you know, do try darting and stuff like that. Um, what has that been like for you to try to ramp up that program in recent years? And has it had any success? Because, um, I mean, there you have somebody volunteering their time to go out and 
provide fertility control for this wild horse population. Maybe we should talk about that a little bit. Familiar with that, Brad? Are you? Yeah, you know, we we do have some partnerships with some local groups, um, and uh, I think they have varying rates of success. You know, when it comes down to darting, you know, I think what is um, more important is what kind of characteristic am I seeing in those horses or that herd? Uh, if you go up to like a McCullough Peaks or a Prior Mountain, these are horses that are used to seeing people, used to seeing cars. So a lot easier to um, approach that horse and dart. I think you have to be within, I want to say 100 yards or 75 yards to be able to uh, effectively dart a horse. You know, you look at some of the, uh, you know, the HMAs uh, like Salt Wells, Adobe Town, 100 feet of those horses, they're going to run off. So, you know, I think that's one of the things uh, that, that is a challenge when it, obviously when we're doing gathers, bring those horses in, we have to maintain that uh, ecological balance. So some of those horses are going to go back out. Obviously those mares are going back out with, um, you know, a full injection of PZP, or again, you know, in the recent Rock Springs gather, uh, we are doing some uh, testing with IUDs. So a handful of them went out with, with, uh, with that. Um, so again, uh, I, I know we have a lot of partners. I know we, we work with folks, uh, but I think the success on that has more to do with the characteristics of the herd and the horse rather than, you know, do we have enough help? Any questions for me? Representative Winner. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, folks, I, I think you probably do understand some of the problems that, of managing these horses. But my question is, um, what efforts are you as agency people doing to uh, educate your superiors to the problem? Um, you know, this, this whole thing about shooting, darting these horses in to, as a method of uh, reduction in numbers is, is fine and dandy, but you got to get them down to numbers before you can, you should even think about that you turn those horses back out and they, they, they keep eating. And that's, that's the main problem that we're having out here uh, in this country is that the, the range resource is just going downhill so quickly and nobody seems to understand that or is doing anything about it. And until you go out and on the range and really look at things, you, you have no clue of, of what's really going on. And I get, uh, emails and phone calls from folks all the time about this horse program and um, it's all emotion so we've got to change that somehow uh, and and it doesn't look like you have a plan to get rid of them i mean we, we can we can go catch them but then what do you do with them and adopt a horse program is on the waning end of things uh and it costs so much money to house these horses over time. So there's got to be another answer. And I think you both know what the answer is. So I'm working that direction. So thank you. Was that were you asking me the question if I knew the answer or feel free to respond if you'd like? Obviously that there was no question there, but you can respond to your own sentiment if you'd like. So. You know, I you know, again, Representative Winter, I you know, I do understand, you know. Euthanasia, euthanizing horses, it's not something that is currently a tool in our toolbox because of that budget rider. It's like, I understand it's in the law. I have lots of conversations about this with folks. Um, you know, and like you said, it does, it does get emotional. It gets emotional on, mm -hmm. on both sides. And, you know, one of the things um, that our director, Holly Waddell, said to me one time is, you know, when we're on these gathers, when we're talking about this, this topic, you know, emotions do get fired up and, you know, people aren't always at their best when they get emotional. So as the Bureau, we have to be at our best. Um, I understand how frustrating it is. Um, but again, um, that tool is not in the toolbox and it's not something that, that we can do, even though it was in the, in the law when it was originally written. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you did mention something a little bit prior to me speaking, and it was about you had to return the horses. Mm -hmm. Well, what? Part you of know, the, yeah, yes, yeah, sir. It, Part of the Wild Horse Borough Act says 
we have to manage these herds as healthy herds. So we have to maintain that balance of you know mares, stallions, things like that. So that's part of what's in the what's in the law, um, which is why you know we do like I said we do PZP. We do try to control that birth rate, uh, but it is something that the law requires us to do uh, when we when we look at these different herds. Uh, you know I've heard people say, well when you gather horses, why don't you just remove all the stallions, take them all? Well that would that would violate the Wild Horse and Burrow Act and probably would not hold up in court if we tried to do that. Okay. So why wouldn't you just remove the whole lot of them? Once again, with the HMAs, it's within the act where the horses were when the Wild Horse and Burrow Act was passed. That's where we, we set the AML. We have to maintain the healthy balance of the herd in conjunction with everything else that's going out there. Uh, so again, that's part of the law that we have to follow. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, now you, you obviously have to realize this is in direct conflict with other wildlife. Sage chickens, this sage grouse, we'll say, use that as an example. How in the Hades of heck do you balance that into keeping these wild horses out there, which I, I, I believe they're invasive species, even though they're beautiful, uh, you know, they're great to watch, I suppose, if you don't happen to have to manage the land. Uh, how do you balance that? How do you balance the damage that they cause? And they do cause damage to the water holes, to their wildlife that trying to survive out there, frankly, in a desert most of the time, uh, except for today. And uh, how, what's your policy there? I, I guess I, I didn't realize you had to return them all. I mean, I, frankly, we don't return them all. We have to return, you know, like, well, like I said, in the wild, in the Rock Springs took 4,200 gathered, 3,500 removed. Um, that's pretty common practice when we do gathers. Again, the horses we put back out, mares are gonna be uh, PZP'd. And getting to your question, Senator, I think where the balance comes in, that's what the appropriate management level or the AML is. That AML has got a high and low. Uh, obviously, everybody here knows, usually we're over the high, um, but that is where we try to strike that balance. So that appropriate management level is how many horses can be out there living with the wildlife, with the grazing, or in the gas development, and everything else that's going out, uh, going on on BLM lands. Okay, specifically with sage chickens, sage grouse, we've got a, an issue with those, right? It's a it's a federal issue with trying to keep that population up. Goes my my particular question is this: is that we we have two issues here. We've got a population of sage grouse that we're trying to maintain because it's causing massive impacts in other areas. And you have a bunch of wild horses, which is, I, would, I, I mean, you tell me if I'm wrong, are negatively impacting the sage grouse and their habitat. And how do you balance that? I mean, you're telling me I got to, you got to do two things at once, I guess. And you really, uh, we, gotta, we gotta do more than two. Yeah, things okay, yeah. I'm just sending it down to two. I wish it was only two. But what do we what do we do to take care? of We got your grouse. They affect everything, and we're playing around with wild horses, trying to I don't know, you know, maintain a certain level that you think so. So how are we gonna do that? What do you do to say like Wyoming's facing impacts with sage grouse? What I mean, what is your methodology that drives you? Does that come? Does that factor in to your choices on how you manage? The, the wild horses it, it certainly does you know i mean and and i think you're you're very much hitting on probably the biggest challenge of of, of working at the bureau of land management it's that multiple use mission mm -hmm. right? we have to balance it all together and that is not easy um so you know if we see you know sage grouse populations and we can link that to to wild horses then you know we're gonna have to look at that and you know do we need to adjust the aml do we need to go out there and do an emergency gather uh, things like that. I'm unaware of any direct link between those two, um, but certainly could be something that's out there. Um, but yeah, I mean, you you sort of hit the nail on the head. It is not easy. Uh, it's a challenge to balance all these uses uh, under our mission. And and I think Senator Kolb, there's a recognition at the national level, right, which is why the national program is trying to pursue funding to to bring in, to, to do additional gathers and do large gathers every year, because there's this larger recognition, not just with sage grouse, but with not being within our AML, but also other, you know, damages to the land, other inter 
experience with other uses as we're trying to balance that multiple use. So I think that's part of the the larger focus of the national programs to try to get us this attention with our appropriators so that we can get better support for this program so that we can get ourselves back into, into AML across the system. Okay. And I mean, we do have to, uh, we're already behind. We haven't got to the rest of the uh, top, you know, the scheduled speakers of public comment on the, um, on this topic. So just that reminder, I know something we've been working on a lot, uh, especially Representative Winter and I, I think, and Representative Heiner on the Ag Committee before, but uh, Representative Winter, with that in mind, please proceed. Uh, could you folks uh, <clears throat> talk to us a little bit about the uh, proposal by the BLM to change the HMAs numbers anyway, and are changing the locations where these HMAs would be located? Uh, I've been reading something about this of late, and so I just needed to get your uh, thoughts on that. And, and Representative Winner, are you referencing the recently released um, Wild Horse Burrow Management Plan for Rock Springs and Rollins? Is that the one you're referencing? Um, the, let me just read the which locations. Um, the Great Divide Basin and Salt Wells Creek HMA, the proposal is to move these to herd areas managed for zero wild horses, and that is due to the checkerboard, you know, and some of those issues that Senator Cole brought up earlier is it's really hard to manage those in the checkerboard, right? One second they're on BLM land, the next second they're on private land, and it keeps going on and on. So that that was the proposal in that in that um, EIS that was just released. However, it's being litigated right now, so we're, we are in litigation under that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So is that going to happen, do you do you think? Or is it going to just go down the way of as many other proposals? Representative Winter, that's a great question because I think it depends on the results of the litigation. And this is all pretty recent. I think we released that plan a month ago and we were like, that was on a Tuesday and we were in litigation with two different groups by Friday. So um, this is pretty recent information. So it's hard for me to predict which way the litigation will go. To wrap it up here, can we add it? I do appreciate in the just a few short years we've been working on this between the agriculture committee and this committee you have made significant headway i'd like to recognize that as well i know this is a, a tough issue it's an emotional issue it, it, it i think it hits a, a nerve among many of our citizens now we are a public land state and sometimes we feel more like a colony than a state um and that's this is a example i think a prime example of that um but i don't also appreciate the work that the BLM has been doing to recognize the issue and make meaningful progress. Um, and that has happened. I think you saw that. You get the idea of the challenges that the BLM is facing when they try to effectively uh, reduce a population in HMA to zero, which is what I heard, and then they're immediately sued. Um, so um, I think, you know, recognizing the long path that they're on, but they have started down it. And we've even helped out a little bit as a state um, along those lines. So I do appreciate the work and still very frustrating situation, I think, for those of us who live here. I can imagine as a rancher having to deal with this issue in addition to everything else being a public lands rancher. But uh, um, yeah, I just appreciate the effort. And I, I want to recognize the effort. I know you've got some tough questions. I want to recognize the effort that the owners put in in recent years too, but also you know, long ways to go and a lot of hurdles to ask. So any further questions for the BLM committee before we move on? Okay, thank you. If you're off the hook for now, thank you, Chairman. Too far. Okay. Okay. Next up, we have the Wyoming stock growers. Uh, uh, Mr. Gagna, welcome back. Obviously, something near and dear um, to the stock grower's heart, and uh, something that you've been involved with, also with the Rock Springs Grazing Association. So, uh, please provide your perspective, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Jim Gagna with the Wyoming Stock Growers Association. I had provided you with a couple of documents. One is some numerical information on wild horse herds nationally in Wyoming and locally. And then one that is sort of outlines some of the litigation that's been involved. And I won't spend any time on those unless there are any questions on, on those documents. I have to say, I something this past week, an unfortunate event brought back some fond memories. And that was the passing of James Watt, former Secretary of Interior. My first interaction with Mr. Watt 
was in 1977 when I, as an officer of the Wyoming of the Rock Springs Grazing Association, went to Denver to meet with Mr. Watt, who at that point was heading up Mountain State's Legal Foundation, and that led to the first litigation in Wyoming, at least, against the management of wild horses and burros. And and that litigation pattern, as you see, has gone on somewhat nonstop since then, and we're in it again at this point in time. But and, and also that made me recall prior to the passage of the Wild Horse and Burrow Act, where of course, and uh, on public lands, on some private lands, and the private sector gathered those horses on periodic schedules. I had the opportunity to observe a couple of those horse gathers, and everyone appreciated seeing the horses there, but we never built up surpluses of horses to where there was a problem. Uh, today, we all know where we are. Uh, I certainly don't say that the BLM has always done the job the way I feel they should, but I, I do, as, as was been mentioned here, uh, I feel they've been put in a difficult position. They're charged with managing a healthy, sustainable resource and then managing horses that are a threat to sustainability of that resource. And Congress passes a law that would have allowed, for the most part, reasonable management and then turns around and on the annual basis pulls back part of it so that they can't proceed with with gathering horses. Today, we're in a situation, there's actually two factors. They're not allowed to sell any horses for to be euthanized. And even on privately owned horses, the USDA has a prohibition against any meat processing facility inspecting wild horses or any horses, I mean, domestic horses. So that's another constraint that, that we have there. But uh, the impacts, as you will understand, are certainly on grazing. Uh, but on our wildlife population, and I would commend the Wyoming Game and Fish Department, they have been good at being at the table with us in keeping the pressure on to get these uh, horse herds uh, reduced. As far as the cost to us as taxpayers, I know in 22, FY22, it was $82 million. I believe there was a slight increase in 23. Uh, there have been requests in Congress to go to $100 million or slightly over whether that will happen or not, I don't know. But uh, uh, back to one of your comments by Senator Kolb, I just see this as you keep throwing money down this hole and the demand is going to grow for more money all the time as long as we deal with this the way we're dealing with it now. Um, so funding is a, is a major issue that I believe needs to be addressed. Um, if we had these herds down to their low AMLs, we believe that it would be possible with the proper program to maintain that using uh, fertility control perhaps. But we believe it's totally impossible to get to those numbers on a sustainable basis with fertility control. It has to involve removal of horses and every horse that's removed becomes another huge burden on the taxpayers of this country to, unless they're adopted out, which only a small percentage are today. Another challenge we're facing recently is some litigation against the use of helicopters for gathers. There are those who feel that we're using any, any powered vehicle to gather horses is abuse of the animals and we shouldn't be doing that. I think the reality is that because helicopters can bring those animals rather quickly into the confinement facility where they're captured, it's probably much easier on the animals than if we're out there trying to do it a horseback and running an animal for three or four days before we got it in. But that's public misconception among many others uh, with regards to this. Um, the current litigation was mentioned, and that's over the recent decision uh, to uh, discontinue uh, two and part of a third HML in southwestern Wyoming because of the checkerboard pattern. The Wild Horse and Burrow Act is clear. If you have wild horses on your private land, notify the agency and they're to remove them. Well, that's great if we didn't have the land ownership patterns that we do here today. So that's, that's an ongoing problem. Uh, I would, it, while it took uh, litigation by the state of Wyoming and then litigation by the Rock Springs Raising Association to get to that point of the BLM finally making a decision to uh, remove those as HMAs due to the checkerboard land pattern, uh, now with the court litigation, how long might it be before we can actually get that done? And then those herds continue to build up again. So, uh, always litigation and, and this current litigation is a threat uh, to the program. And, and I've visited with some wild horse advocates who sincerely believe that we need more adequate control. 
They want a healthy population. They don't want an excess population. But the, the more radical views that don't exist so much here in Wyoming, but in other places, seem to always come to the top in moving this forward. Um, a couple of things just in the wanting to move along here of what may be this committee or you know, last year we had um, joint resolution three led by representative winters uh, certainly stated the issue well but i'm just not and we certainly supported it but not sure that a joint resolution back to dc gets very much done on any subject that's uh, one of the concerns uh, much of the problem lies with congress whether some pressure on Congress, and certainly our delegation doesn't need it, but with their help on others to provide at least some short-term relief from the prohibition on uh, euthanizing horses, that would be a way to get an answer in a reasonable time. Whether that could be done, I don't know, but that might be an effort that this committee would want to consider uh, leading along with that. Um, another uh, thing that you might be helpful on there's a unique situation here in Southwestern Wyoming. There's a herd of horses that are uh, west of here, over into Uinta County, I believe some up in, into Lincoln County, maybe slightly over into Sweetwater, that the BLM has determined are not wild horses under their jurisdiction. They're populations of horses that evolved. I have to believe some of them maybe went from an HMA, but they're not in an HMA, they're not under their jurisdiction. The landowners and the ranchers over in that area are becoming desperate to get those horses removed. The issue becomes who pays for that removal? That could be as many as seven or 800 horses as I understand, um, the, which would be quite a burden on those landowners. I visited with some of the Wyoming BLM just recently and they indicated that they may be able to assist with that, not using dollars from the Wild Horse and Burrow Program, but using dollars that are dedicated to resource management because those horses, are a good part of the time on public lands and they're having a negative impact on those public lands. So I, you know, I don't know where that can go. I'm going to continue to pursue it. And that might be a, another place where this committee could uh, weigh in and be of some assistance. And uh, other than that, I would be happy to answer any questions. I know we have representatives here from the Rock Springs Grazing Association and they have had to live with this program since day one. Um, and unfortunately live with a lot of it, both through loss of uh, forage and through litigation. And we at Wyoming Stuckers have been a part of much of that litigation along with the state of Wyoming. And specific things to this, I would defer to them, but be happy to answer any questions after if you have them. Wagner, there else. Um, Jim, do you have a, are you, are you aware of a, like any kind of comprehensive studies that have been done that talk about a wild horse impacts on sage grouse that really kind of look at that relationship and what the impact that's have on had on sage grouse habitat uh, mr chairman senator ellis i'm not aware of a formal study i could check into that i do know you know i think those of us out on the land observe it but uh, game and fish has certainly expressed to us their concern about the impacts on on sage grouse uh but and, and part of it is because the horses are out there year round, you know, most of the livestock grazing on all these public lands is not taking place during the, the breeding season for grouse, but with horses, they're there all the time. And uh, there are undoubtedly impacts, but as far as an actual study, we have to do a little more work on that. I mean, maybe that's something we should look at. And I, I think that's the concern I have is, you know, when we look at sage grouse, the conversation is always about industrial development or grazing impact. Um, and so, you know, you see litigation all the time trying to halt some of that activity. But on the flip side of it, then we don't even hold our federal agencies to the same accountability standards when they have maybe, and who knows what the impact is, I'm guessing substantial. But maybe, um, Mr. Chairman, based on some further looking into this issue, maybe that's something we could ask our university to look into with a formal study. That might be another thing to think about. Mr. Chairman, I think there would be some some real merit in that because uh, we all know that the damage is being done, and that's to a key species that is uh, at risk of being listed uh, in Wyoming today or throughout the West as a, as a threatened species, and uh, it's something we can't ignore. So I'm, I'll follow up with it and would encourage the committee to do so as well. 
other questions and as good input center we'll see how we want to proceed on that or just an informal inquiry or in, or maybe just something more formal but um yeah sure okay um represent winner chairman uh mr mcgagna do you, who would be the contact for these horses you were talking about in western wyoming that uh, are not considered to be wild do you happen to know that uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Winter, I could give you several contacts of landowners over there who are concerned and wanting to uh, have them removed. And I believe there's been some county commissioners involved in the discussion, but I'd, I'd have to work on, I could get you some names. I wouldn't have that just to offer okay. sitting here at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McGagna, thank you uh, for testifying here. So let's say that we do a bird study and we find out that they're impacting it. We just heard from the, the BLM, they're doing all they can. So what difference will it make? Honestly, uh, if they're doing all they can, they don't have the funding, their hands are tied. I don't even know what we're trying to fix here. It's a federal government issue. It looks like to me until we can get them out of our hair this problem will never go away. Mr. Chairman and Representative Tarver, I, I, I don't disagree with you, but I think there's a couple of things that could happen and they're not direct answers. Uh, if we had the evidence of the impact on sage grouse, some of the conservation or environmental community out there who are so strongly behind wild horses and think that we don't need to uh, do anything except allow them to continue to propagate on the land that might cause them to reconsider their positions a little bit because we're having an impact on something else that they also seriously care about uh and in the same light perhaps some impact uh in dealing with members of congress uh to get some at least some short-term relief to recognize that uh, without some total removal of horses that we just can't get there and i mean one we can't get there because a budgetary reason because the need for funding is going to just continue to explode and two is just finding places to hold these wild horses even so i that would be the only reason i could see that maybe being able to point to these other impacts could make a difference Chairman, well, uh, something just popped in my brain here. Maybe uh, the state of Wyoming can adopt them and then we can sell them to uh, someone to euthanize them. Maybe that would be a way to take care of this whole problem. <laughs> I do I do believe that there's some follow-up when you adopt a horse, making sure that it's not happening. But um, at least we, uh, my question, I guess, um, um, so we have, the state of Wyoming has done a few things recently. I think we appropriate half million dollars. Most of that actually went to uh, the, the tribes on the River Reservation to help with the. Uh, uh, they have a similar problem that's, and they're not constrained by uh, BLM rules. Um, so we have had, I guess, similar conversations looking to find ways to help manage for this problem. After all, these things don't necessarily respect political boundaries, like a, what's on the reservation, what's on BLM. Um, so just. And I think we also had another appropriation through the Wildlife Natural Resource Trust. I could just summarize your understanding of what we've been able to do so far as far as uh, state assistance and helping with this problem. Mr. Chairman, my understanding is that with the help of those state dollars, that's been extremely helpful on the reservation in terms of getting that horse number down. And of course, they don't have these constraints. They can and they typically ship horses to Canada or to Mexico. There was a bit of a hiccup this past year because the holding facility in Canada had shut down. And so they were left with just Mexico. And I'm not sure if they're back into Canada or not. But along that line of, of those dollars targeted there, I had mentioned the herd of horses west of here that are not deemed to be a damn horses. Uh, if there were an opportunity to get some state dollars available there to match with some federal dollars, to get that herd removed uh, totally, that that could certainly be a place to help at least in that area. Okay, go ahead. So I wanted to follow up to be clear. I think a study would also be beneficial in litigation. All of our federal agencies, when they do make big decisions, have to show their homework and show their work. 
And so, you know, if we do have a study, that's something a court could certainly consider in any kind of listing litigation. So I, I do think there might be some value to it. So I, I just wanted to say that's the, the intent. Appreciate that very much. That's a good point, yes. Okay, any further questions so far? Okay, thank you for your thank ongoing you, efforts. Chairman. We appreciate it. And I will open up to public comment. Anybody wants to uh, testify, now's your chance. Come on down, don't be bashful. No, no. Just remember to introduce who you are if you're uh, representing yourself or representing a, an organization. And uh, yeah, please uh, proceed with your testimony. My name is John Hay, and I'm the president of the Rock Springs Grazing Association. And this is Don Schramm, and um, he is my right hand man. I couldn't do my job without him. And he spent 37 years with the BLM. And so he's been involved in the original gathers that took place back in the late seventies, early eighties. And I think he has some information he would like to share with you, first of all, in regard to that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman for, whoop, there's a button on this thing. Is there a button? Uh, I guess the old story is according to Paul Harvey, now the rest of the story. We've heard the BLM story, and with all due respect, my comments have been exchanged with several state directors, assistant directors, secretaries of interior, and others, well documented in the public record of BLM and the courts. And I'll briefly give you a blue collar version of some of the discussions on horses in our experience. Uh, my name is Don Schramm. I retired from BLM in 2001 after 37 years in BLM. And since 2003, I've assisted in the management and the land operations of Rock Springs Grazing. It is often said you don't know where you're going until you understand where you've been. This has been applied to world history, American history, and for sure in wild horses. When I was first exposed to wild horses, I had just arrived at the Rock Springs office in 1977 and told I need to plan to build a big corral for the for wild horses. I knew little about wild horses other than seeing a herd on Oregon Buttes and a bunch on top of Green Mountain near Jeffrey City. Then I was told there was a lot of wild horses and BLM awarded a contract for a contractor to gather 250 horses south of Little America the same area the previous discussion described. That contract was terminated after it was realized a contractor could not catch any horses with riders. And he had arranged for a helicopter to help, which at that time was illegal. And I have to say, one of the people very familiar with that is sitting right at the end of the table because he was in charge of the wild horse program then. Then I was told to plan and organize the first BLM Roundup with authorized use to helicopters. Only after conversations with a couple of BLM wranglers, we finally did figure out how to round up with riders and a helicopter as a team. That was during the fiscal years 77 and 78. It was a real education for this civil engineer. In between my other responsibilities for engineering and minerals, I was aware of a growing frustration among BLM staff and managers and RSGA, there are far too many wild horses, and the BLM Washington office would not address the problem beyond limited gathering across BLM. This is only six years after the passage of that, and now there's already too many horses. 1978. Then I was informed that RSGA then had asked the U.S. Marshal, according to the act, that's who you go to, to gather all the horses off private land in the checkerboard. But there was no immediate response, so the recommendation from the BLM to Rock Springs, you're gonna to have to sue to draw attention to the problem, and they did. In the meantime, Wyoming BLM was actually trying to increase funding so it could gather and decrease the number of, of horses that were approaching 6,000 just here in Rock Springs District, not including Kemmer or Pinedale. The BLM team I was a part of was asked to evaluate capability and estimate the amount of funding and scheduling required 
to reduce the number of horses. BLM Wyoming complied without delay, but it took from 1980 to 1985 to reduce the number of horses from almost 7,000 to 1,600. 1,600 was a number that was agreed to be allowed and be on private land and public in the whole area. The number RSG agreed with interest groups, it was a local group of International Society for Protection of Mustang and Burles and Wild Horses, yes, worked with Rock Springs Grazing to agree to have the same number of horses in this area that existed at the passage of the act, roughly 1,600 based on a game and fish inventory. Judge Kerr in one in the, what we often call the Kerr decision, 1980, agreed with that approach. Judge Kerr's order says remove all horses from the Rock Springs district unless those approved and acceptable to Rock Springs grazing. And that was 1600. That's the agreement often mentioned in some of the documents you read in the media. I recall one district manager and two state directors ordering me to keep keep them out of jail. We had a court order to get them off and do what the court ordered. We did our best. We had the support of the state BLM, wild horse interest groups, the Washington office, employees, administrative officers, and RSGA. It was a team effort. Forward to 1993, the period 1993 to 2013, the horse numbers in the district cycled up and down depending on when there was an agreement and would be from near never down never down to AML near high AML or double they would double by the time the next roundup and depending on all this depended on the cycle of gathers and the cycle of gathers was three to five years horses doubled 20 to 40 percent per year as our records and other public records confirm the numbers far exceeded the number agreed in the Kerr decision. And despite BLM protests and documents to BLM and interior officials, the horse numbers continue to increase and would vary three to 4,000 down up in 2014, there were 4,000 horses, significantly more than the 1,600. And that was despite in a, a roundup just a few years prior, a couple years prior. 2013, RSGA abandoned its consent to tolerate wild horses on private land and RSGA demanded removal of all horses from Rock Springs grazing land, a checkerboard. A second lawsuit was filed and resulted in a negotiated consent decree for a term of 10 years. Sufficient time for BLM to adjust populations and mount modified land use plans to formally remove private land from horse management areas. However, there was a new management team in BLM, Rock Springs and Cheyenne, and there was less of a commitment to honor the intent of the consent decree. Rock Springs Grazing continued to pr protest the progress in keeping horse numbers to the agreed number of 1,600. June 2023, today, the consent decree expired in April. The proposed land use for the Rock Springs RMP was only recently released. It will be challenged. There are far more horses today than when the consent decree was signed in 2013. A little different than the Kerr decision. The numbers went like this. For the consent decree, they go like this. Hardly the intent of the court action. The BLM public record will apply the population today is near AML, 1,800, 2,000 at the end of the last roundup. However, last winter, BLM, can, with great credit, spent a considerable amount of money to have an infrared aerial census of the land for the horses. 4,700 were counted more than double what they claimed was there. To date, that number has not been released or discussed in any of the documents. 
Today and into the future, the population of wild horses across Wyoming are going to vary around 7,000. Population described as threatened at the time of the act. There's no foreseeable solution offered by BLM other than more funds. The legislatures of Wyoming and surrounding states should establish a team effort to create awareness and suggest procedures to Congress to mitigate the overpopulation of wild horses on state, private, and public land. As history has demonstrated, BLM is not capable of implementing and maintaining established wild horse management plans. In 1993, officials declared the wild horse program was in control. It will now be a management mode of monitoring and analysis. Well, that didn't work. The horse numbers just keep going. BLM has got to look at themselves in the face and create another aggressive project to reduce the number of horses rather than to discuss horse management. There are long ways from ever implementing real horse management. Thank you for your comments, and I'd be glad to answer any questions or for John. Okay, thank you, Mr. Shrem. Any questions for the Grace Association, Mr. Kochem? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Shrem, thank you for this information and some of the background material. So since 20, the consent decree in 2013, has the BLM ever met the consent decree numbers that were agreed upon? And if not, what makes you confident that they will manage them appropriately now uh, as uh, they promised? No, not, we keep our own set of numbers. And it's well known with BLM and Rock Springs Gray disagree on numbers. I would have to say the infrared study even exceeded our numbers. Are they going to be able to do it? Not under the existing political climate. Congress has got to change some. The act has the tools to do what you need to do. A discussion that I didn't hear mentioned today and has been discussed over a number of years is rather than just having adoption, you need to have immediate sale authority. I helped develop the Adopt a Horse program in Rock Springs. At that time, we had people lined up from every state. It was like a, a meat market where you grab the number before you go to the corral. We only had to worry about a few horses over 500 for over five years. And then we had a process where they could be transferred to one of the Rosebud reservations in South Dakota for immediate care, and it worked. That program, you know, just programs like that were done away with. Uh, the problem with the adopt the horse program could work a lot more, but the basic problem is there is no domestic horse market. The adopt the horse program works when somebody can get rid of an old domestic horse and look for a replacement. They can't even get rid of the old horse now because of the restrictions for for uh, no meat inspectors, you can't go to a plant. It's it's all locked up until the basic tools are reinvented. This this is going to go on for on and on. To answer one more your question, ma'am, or Senator, yes, there are a number of studies on sage grouse impacts to wild horses. We've addressed that in our court briefs and very Honestly, it's been a struggle to get BLM to admit there is a, a problem. We're, we rely now on game and fish and other interest groups uh, for the conflicts of wildlife. Okay, and would there be a way for you to forward that to our uh, LSO staff so we can get a hold of those studies? I'm sorry, I'm having a good one. Yeah, could you forward those studies to us so we can review I, them? Uh, I, could, I have a source that can now get them outlined. Okay, yeah. Okay, follow up, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Schramm, with that uh, consent decree back in 2013, was the state of Wyoming part of that consent decree for trespass on, on no, state actually, lands? Actually, the state of Wyoming had a lawsuit and its own consent decree that went on for 10 years with the same objectives to get the horse numbers down across. It expired and it was not renewed. Okay. We have the consent decree and the objectives have not been met. And we've asked for an extension 
been willing to participate in an extension. So far, uh, that conversation has not carried forward. Mr. We've Chair had all these discussions with current state director, previous acting state directors, and other officials. Mr. Chairman, hold up. Mr. Chairman, appears that uh, litigation is is something that you may have to res resort to, and because of the consent decree and and lack of following that consent decree, standing appears in my uneducated eyes that you have standing to litigate that. Uh, so but, you know, in, in order to get the attention of of the federal government, it, it may have to resort to courts. And our 2013 lawsuit is, is still on the books. It is still subject to additional litigation. Allison Sarnipal. Mr. Chairman, and I asked this question of the BLM briefly about numbers, and um, we had this extraordinary winter where we saw a lot of wildlife um, fatality, mortality, whatever you want to call it. Um, I'm curious, so from your perspective, did this winter impact wild horse populations at all? Did you see some them dying out there on the range or, or were they kind of immune to it? I doubt it. I, I witnessed in the 83, 1982, 83, we had another tough winter and I flew the desert and you could find, you could find a few, the same thing you could find again, but it's, it's lim it would be limited. They're tough. I'd have to say they might even have helped the antelope by digging in for them, but it's not, I doubt it. Chairman, um, Mr. Schramm, I had asked the question earlier and the BLM didn't have an answer uh, on any compensation given to say you and your, and your organization uh, for damages by wild horses on the property. Is there, have they done anything to mitigate that financially if they can't take care of the horses? Uh, um, I'll I answer it this way, Senator. Uh, after the Kerr decision, that was followed by a case to the 10th Circuit on a, on a taking of private resources by the wild horses and trespass and suit. And there was a whole document of description of the, of the legal history of why it cannot be done. There has been no offer. Uh, it's a little odd that we're offering $60 million plus the private ranches in Oklahoma to take care of them. This committee. Okay, thank you, gentlemen, for your input. It's good to hear from your experience and perspective. Oh, you go ahead, you have something. I just wanted to make a couple of comments, if I could, please. Uh, Senator Kolb, um, not only in legal fees to sue the government to do the job that the act says you go to the magistrate and, and tell them you want to remove from private property and away you go. That's not been our experience. We've spent an awful lot of time in court. As to Senator Ellis's question, um, we've this winter and this spring, of course, has been very wet. But prior to this, we've had many extremely dry years, and habitat is uh, terribly important to the sage grouse population, and it's been dramatically affected. Then you put on top of that the horse numbers. They gather 3,500, and there are 4,700 on top of that number. And you know, when it's supposed to be 1,600, I can assure you that they've done major resource damage as to not only the sage grouse, but everything else out there. Um, and you have livestock, of course, you have the horse population. We have a very large elk population. Unfortunately, the deer and antelope took a major hit, hit this year. And there were some elk losses, but nothing like what deer and antelope experienced. But all of that is competition for the same forage. And there's no doubt that the sage grouse have been dramatically affected by the number of horses that are out there. As to the consent decree, uh, when we went to Judge uh, Friedenthal in, in 2010, um, she ruled that the horses had to be removed just as Judge Kerr had done back in, in 79. And uh, the BLM came to us and asked if we would consider um, an accommodation such that every time a horse came from the solid block onto the checkerboard that we wouldn't be calling them. 
and therefore the discussion for the consent decree was was entered into and in 13 the agreement was uh, put in place the idea of the consent decree was that um, first they would do the amendment just now that is now just being litigated uh, that that would have taken place in the first or second year of the consent decree and with that in mind they would be able to control the numbers the thought was if if the plan for the consent decree was followed that we would have the horse population down to zero with the exception of white mountain um, four years after so in 2017 instead the numbers have grown unbelievably well beyond as don said even our expectation we had guessed after the gather there were around 3800 horses there but the infrared count which is indisputable i mean you you can see the images of not only the horses but the um the elk and, and it, it gets down to enough detail if they have a picture of a whether it be a horse or an elk standing there as they move their feet you can see the heat signature from their hoof on the ground i mean it is there's no way you can dispute the numbers there we've always had difficulty with the horse people saying oh they're just exaggerating the numbers well it, it's all in place now they they can't dispute that um and so it's it's our hope that one, we could get the consent decree back in place. The reason being, we know this is going to be fought in court, and court battles never happen overnight. And um, when you have the consent decree, you're moved up in status as to when you can have a gather. And we have more horses now on the range than what we had when we first went to D.C. to start the lawsuit. We went and told them we needed them removed, and they essentially laughed at us. So we went to court and were successful. And as an accommodation to the BLM, we entered the consent decree to make it um, an easier project to work with. Unfortunately, the people that we worked with on that are gone, and we've not had the cooperation uh, since then in order to get this job finished. Chairman, Mr. Hay, thank you for that that testimony. As we've heard, the the Federal government is paying a tremendous amount of money for other ranchers to house these these animals that are taken off of the range. Uh, Mr. Schramm mentioned uh, $60 million maybe going to Oklahoma to ranchers. So with the infrared, it's pretty pretty easy to prove how many wild horses you're, you're supporting. Mm -hmm. Has there been any discussion in the past about the, the uh, the federal government printing some more money to pay the Rock Springs Grazing Associ <laughs> Association and compensating you for housing animals that they're willing to pay other ranchers to take care of these animals. Why not pay Rock Springs Grazing? In the first Kerr decision, there was a second case that did exactly that. As for um, payment on resource damage on forage that was taken, and the court said, no, thank you. Uh, there hasn't been another attempt since then, but that doesn't mean that that discussion shouldn't take place. To clarify, I'd, if I can, Mr. Chairman, mm -hmm. to clarify the situation in this Rock Springs, you have a huge area that goes from Colorado line up to the Sweetwater. You know, you've got solid block, all public land, and you got the checkerboard. With the Kerr decision, it was recognized that because of winter, Regardless of where the horses are in the summer, the majority, the vast majority will end up on private land in the checkerboard, just like the antelope, elk, and everything else does. It's winter range. And that's why the history of some of this litigation is the cooperation of Rock Springs grazing was required even to maintain the horses on the all public land, because they're eventually going to be down on private. So it's it's a real conflict. It's a real problem. Okay, any further discussion, committee? Okay, thank you, gentlemen, for your time. Appreciate your efforts. Thank you very Keep much. Keep up your work. I know you will. Okay, any further public comment? We have somebody online, actually, so we'll uh, pivot um, to online public comment. In the meantime, if anybody in the room wants to come on down, um, feel free to just uh, come on down to the the microphones here, but we'll go ahead and uh, 
Uh, I think we have somebody online. So whenever they get into the room that they can introduce themselves and uh, say who they're with, if they're representing a group or just themselves and proceed with the testimony. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay, great. Uh, Ms. Chapman, welcome uh, to the committee. Uh, feel free to introduce yourself and proceed with the testimony. Okay. I'm representing the Wyoming Wild Horse Improvement Partnership. And I just wanted to uh, thank the committee for this topic um, being brought forth as, a, as part of a natural resource management um, issue. And I'd like to, to, to just state that our group has been working to build some partnerships within the state of Wyoming regarding wild horse management. We recognize that this is uh, an, an issue we, um, I think we are part of the, uh, the groups that were mentioned by Mr. Magagna um, as recognizing that, you know, the wild horses have a place in Wyoming. They are part of the um, resources that the Bureau of Land Management manages and, uh, or is you know, tasked with managing. Um, and yet we also recognize the impacts to the state of Wyoming on a state level uh, for both the industries that are represented um, being oil and gas, um, tourism, and also agriculture in that order as the top three industries in the state. Um, and they definitely do have an impact um, to all of those industries. So what, um, what I wanted to, to just sort of put forth here today is that we are also one of the, we, we have volunteers, individual volunteers within our group who are part of the um, darting projects and uh, that are being done with the Bureau of Land Management. Um, we are actively working, we have volunteers who are actively working with the um, Rollins Field Office in the Stewart Creek herd management area on a darting project there. Um, and that, uh, that is, um, started last year, um, and, and we're, we're making some headway. So those are, uh, we're doing that as individual volunteers. Um, and then everything else that I'm going to talk about here really quick for you is not as a representative, you know, we, we're not representatives of the Bureau of Line Management. I want to make that very clear. Um, but we are a part of that solution. We have a solution because we believe that that's important. Um, as Wyoming Wild Horse Improvement Partnership, we are also seeing that there is a lack of uh, solid information out there for people who um, that kind of guide the BLM and how things are done um, might trigger some of these lawsuits against the BLM. Uh, things like that. There's been a lot of discussion today really outlining the challenges that the BLM face. And I think we can all agree that they're pretty hefty challenges um, to kind of uh, educate the public a little better about tentacles that sort of fan out from the wild horse issue. And, you know, a lot of those have been touched on today. There's the agriculture and the forage and the health of the land, um, impacts to sage grouse, impacts to the uh, wildlife that share the range. Um, and then, you know, back again to the impacts to the industry. I think that wild horses uh, definitely play a huge role in the tourism industry there are people who travel to Wyoming specifically to see our wild horses. And so then you look at um, places like the White Mountain area that has a designated wild horse loop, yet it's a part of the checkerboard problem. Um, and it's part of all of this uh, topic that, or discussion that Mr. Schramm um, brought to the table. And I think he did an excellent job of outlining the, the attempts um, of 
of their group to work with the BLM and wild horse management um, and their involvement, which is, is, you know, part of the, you know, they were the original managers. They were, they were part of that. Um, And I also feel like we are very supportive as a group, Wyoming Wild Horse Improvement Partnership. Um, We're supportive of, of their suggestion of a team to address uh, this situation and raise more awareness. And, and that's kind of what I'm offering here is that we would like to, you know, be a part of that team. If, if possible, we would really like to be invited to the table there um, or have a seat at the table. And then we would like to be helpful in disseminating some of that information to um, people who are more passionate about the wild horses being on the, on the landscape Uh, We feel like it needs to be protected. The landscape needs to be protected. The horses need to be protected. Um, And there's, there's, there's a lot more to it. Um, But in a nutshell, that's kind of, kind of how I, what I wanted to say here. Um, I'd also like to offer that one of our constraints right now is funding, um, as is everybody's. So far, we are an all volunteer organization And I think that we are starting to see a need for some funding that will help us get that message out there, that will help us in the endeavor to spread awareness. Um, There are some other groups that are conservation-minded who do an excellent job throughout the state of Wyoming of uh, introducing other topics. Um, And just a, a quick for instance on that might be the Wyoming Wildlife Federation and, you know, they've done some ex- uh, just amazing work, but they have these little um, informational gatherings on topics that are relevant to all of the wild places that Wyoming has. Um, and this last one was a presentation by, the last one I attended was a presentation by the Whedon Pest about Leafy Spurge. Um, you know, it, it, that, is, that is a problem. Um, that can be spread by recreationists and uh, can detriment the landscape pretty heavily. And so just raising awareness about what, why leafy spurge is a problem and, and, you know, if we were to apply it to the wild horse issue, um, why it would impact wild horses, why it would impact the landscape that the wild horses call home and what people can do to prevent that spread. Um, so they had the um, clean play go um, motto of people cleaning off their vehicles and their shoes and, and things like that before they recreate in those areas. So, I mean, that's sort of like a model that's in my head right now, but again, it takes, it takes people who are more than just volunteers to get those things done. Um, it takes, it takes some effort and, We've been talking about money being passed around here um, to different things. Is there is there potential for some funding to go towards um, a team that um, is able to do these kinds of things, educate the public about this? We are getting ready to launch a podcast that we hope would be something that would have an international reach because the people who fight for wild horses in Wyoming, and when I say fight for, that's uh, not a very good term because I think they fight against wild horses in some ways. Um, and I'm just going to speak to this lawsuit that the BLM is facing right now. Is that for or against the wild horses? Uh, I, it could go either way, depending on who's, who's looking at it. Um, and so, you know, the people who are supportive of that and the people who actually filed that litigation, they don't even, some of them don't even live in the state of Wyoming. So, getting that information out to uh, on, a, on a national level to people so they really understand what Wyoming's challenges are. They're unique, they're specific to this area, and the horses are specific to this area. Um, we, we heard from the BLM who talked about um, the, her- the McCullough Peaks and the prior herds that are much easier to dart. Stewart Creek is going to be a herd that's easier to dart than, say, some of the Green Mountain horses or specifically Antelope Hills, is going to be a hard one that it would be a difficult place to ever dart. But 
we have seen from other states when ag interest groups pulled together with horse interest groups and the two went to the BLM and worked together, they were able to come up with solutions that got the fertility control into those horses because those groups were able to provide manpower or provide money that the BLM did not have access to. And then they worked under the direction of the BLM to dart those horses used to, to frequent. And they were able to get those horses darted with fertility control. Um, so, you know, we, we, have, we have research, we have gone to a lot of conferences. We are very educated in this. We have ranching background. Uh, in our management, we have uh, livestock management background in our manage uh, in the management of our group, and we have the people who have a pretty good knowledge of it. And so, we would really love to be a part of the conversation. We would love to be included in really specific just to the BLM horses, um, but you know, whatever help we could offer for horses, say uh, that Mr. McGagnon was talking about in the far. But it's important. Right. That makes a lot and sense. That's- yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you for that testimony. And, uh, you know, I think part of the discussion moving forward will be something along the lines of what we've done in previous years, which is provide a, a pot of state money that anybody can apply for. I think the last round went to the, the tribes and to um, the honor farm. So I just say uh, stay tuned for that um, if that's a possibility moving forward. So, committee, any questions for Ms. Chapman? Okay. Saying none, thank, thank you. you for your time. And uh, uh, yeah, we'll be in contact moving forward, depending on what the committee does. So um, just checking, it looks like nobody else in the room. Okay, it looks like public comment on this topic is closed. Committee, are, are we looking to do anything in particular? We volunteer to reach out to the Appropriations Committee to see if we want to fund another round of funds or we want to do something more formal. Senator Ellis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I did find a few. I'll circulate to our committee. A USGS study that was done in 2021. So um, we can look at, we'll just look at it some more and evaluate whether or not we need to discuss it further. Any further discussion? We've had plenty of discussion. Any, any further solutions, committee, to a difficult uh, topic? Okay, so like I said, we've, uh, the state of Wyoming has shipped in um, recently on two different occasions. It sounds like there might be further opportunity um, potentially um, on the reservation where the you know BLM rules do not apply um, and where uh, it sounds like some areas that are uh, where we have wild horses which do not fall under BLM jurisdiction. So we can follow up on that. Uh, for now, I don't think we need any formal action from the committee. Okay, uh, Senator Kolb. Just for clarification, so we are going to pursue the uh, potential impacts of uh, wild horses on sage grouse yeah. habitat. Yes. All right. Thank you. Important topic. So uh, there's a break scheduled. Uh, we will not be taking a break. If you need to just go up and uh, you know take a personal break, that's fine. Just make sure we retain a quorum. Um, so we'll just go ahead and uh, push on through. Next up, um, oil and gas leasing. Uh, BLM's back at the table. Feel free to introduce yourself if you haven't done it. I work for BLM Wyoming, and I'm the Deputy State Director for Minerals and Lands. Let's see, whoever would like to take it. Okay. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Phone adjusted. BLM Wyoming will be holding an oil and gas lease sale in two weeks, with additional sales currently projected to be scheduled in September and December of this year. The sale later this month currently includes 116 parcels, totaling approximately 127,015 acres. BLM Wyoming is currently evaluating 81 parcels, totaling approximately 67,303 acres, and we'll send all these to you guys So, um, for the September sale. BLM Wyoming is currently evaluating 47 parcels, totaling approximately 46,250 acres for the December sale. To date in fiscal year 2023, BLM Wyoming has approved about 350 applications for permits to drill or APDs, 
We've also received about 430 new APDs this fiscal year, and there are currently over 1,900 federal permits approved and available to drill by industry in Wyoming. As a quick reminder, in August of last year, the president signed the Inflation Reduction Act into law. The act did change several oil and gas fiscal provisions that were last updated in 1987. Minimum bids for all offered parcels increased from $2 per acre to $10 per acre. Royalty rates are now set at 16.67%, up from the previously 12.5%. Rental rates are now $3 per acre for the first two years, $5 per acre for three year, for sorry, for years three through eight, and $15 in years nine and ten. Rental rate. Each year thereafter. I mean, it feels like I'm okay. It feels like it was going in and out. Sorry. Um, the IRA also eliminates non competitive leasing, but it does authorize additional rounds of competitive leasing of available parcels. It requires a fee for expressions of interest for oil and gas leasing of $5 per acre. Secretary can adjust the every four years for inflation. And then I will be deferring to Mr. Spencer for most questions. Okay, any questions committee? Representative Heiner. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chairman Boner. I, I understand that there's a requirement that you offer uh, parcels for lease throughout the, the year. Is there a number of uh, of acreage that has to be offered, or you could could you decrease that uh, to maybe just ten parcels? Uh, is you know is 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 there a quantity that is required by law that you offer per lease? Representative Heiner, there there is no minimum requirement for acreage that we offer. There are requirements that we process the expressions of interest that are submitted and we go through an evaluation process of those parcels and if they meet the evaluation criteria we do offer those parcels up there is also a tie under the inflation reduction act related to renewable energy right-of-way approvals and so it had a couple couple numerical requirements which were it set a standard of either approximately blm offering two million acres for sale a year or at least 50% of the expressions of interest received every year. So, so there's an interest in issuing renewable energy right aways, and there's clearly the tie with the number of parcels we offer. So there is a lot of balance looked at those parcels there to make sure that we meet that criteria so that we can issue renewable energy right away approvals. As a follow-up, Mr. Spencer, thank you for that information. But as I look at the numbers, it appears to me that the uh, the quantity of parcels being offered for oil and gas leasing is decreasing year over year for the last few years. Is that true, or am I am I wrong in my evaluation? Uh, Representative Heiner, the the number of parcels have varied, and generally we've been on a a, a downward trend. Uh, we we've seen a slight increase recently as the new Inflation Reduction Act requirements have been implemented we had a we had a lull i will say for approximately a year with very few expressions of interest coming in with the five dollar an acre requirement we've seen it we've seen a slow increase with those coming in more more than being submitted now when people realize if you need a parcel there was a, a little bit of learning experience clearly the uh, economic criteria the rentals the uh, royalty rate and all that went up so there's some substantial decisions folks had to make when they submit an expression of interest, but when you're when you're going to pay, from my perspective, when you're going to pay five dollars per acre, you're going to be pretty tight on your expression of interest versus what we got before, where a lot of uh, really generic expressions of interest that might say all the acreage in Township 36 through 40, range 90 through 95 West, and those might break into four or five, ten parcels, for example. A lot tighter expressions of interest now that you're paying five acres per five dollars per acre. If we do have that information and leading up to, you know, the time prior, you know, to the Inflation Reduction Act and the at least some form of uh, certainty there, even if maybe not all of us like what was in it, um, 
you know, I, I thought it was year over year, about 90% reduction in permits based off that one lease sale you had in what, June of last year. And that was the only one you had between the time the new administration you know, took office and when you know, the Inflation Reduction Act um, occurred. So it'd be interesting to see how that compares to the previous administration's, you know, annual uh, average. I think you have to take the annual average since, you know, each lease sale varies significantly. But um, we, we did have that number before from the prior administration. I just don't remember what it was off the top of my head. But um, yeah, it'd be interesting to see what the, now that we have some certainty uh, with what the new rules are, see what the exactly the effect has been. We, we know when there was, you know, uncertainty and when we knew that it was negative, like an over an 18% royalty rate, for example, in those leases, that it was a 90% reduction. I do remember that. So um, that would be uh, helpful for me at least to continue to gauge the effect of these decisions on our industry and, and recognizing that, yeah, this is just one part of a very complicated process, right? I'm sure an oil and gas company wants to have as many options as possible when it comes to drilling. And, you know, it's just as what this is one more constraint among many that, that they have to deal with when it seems like sometimes those rig schedules uh, change on a weekly basis. So, uh, um, so anyways, if you could provide that, I, I think that'd be helpful to help get I think my co-chairman's questions as well. So. And yes, Mr. Go ahead. make sure I got that question correctly. So you'd like to understand the number of acres kind of in parcels before the Inflation Reduction Act and before this administration, correct? Correct. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And we can compare it to what we got going on now. I think that'd be helpful. So any questions for the BLM? Okay, I appreciate your testimony. I think this is something that we're, we're fairly well versed on on this uh, committee, and uh, it's just good to hear the update as to how this uh, so-called IRA is uh, being implemented and the impact. We'll continue to assess that. So, well, Mr. Chairman, I would I would add that we we made some big strides, and that there's recognition that the process is always moving. At any one point, you're working on three different parts of three different sales at one time. So got a lot of acknowledgement finally you got to get a schedule together it's regular it doesn't happen and doesn't turn on a dime and so that that's been a i don't want to call it a breakthrough that's always been understood but getting those schedules clearly submitted and everybody understanding in order to meet these deadlines here's how you work backwards and here we do it and we've made we've made tremendous progress in the last year getting that acknowledgement and understanding all the pieces that have to get done if you want to have a sale so there's been good progress on that front even with the new criteria Go ahead. Quick question, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Mr. Spencer, what is the time frame from when a when a parcel is being an expression of interest is submitted to where it's actually offered for lease? How much what time lag are we looking at? Uh, Representative Heiner, it's it's approximately 10 months to a year. We we typically are planning a year ahead because you have to have a, a cutoff date for your expression of interest so you know what you're working on. Then you've got to put all those parcels together. Then you've got to go through a public scoping notice for, for 30 days. You've got to prepare the environmental assessment. Then the environmental assessment has to go out for a 30-day public comment period. You have to address all those comments. Then 60 days before the sale, you put the sale notice out for the protest period for 30 days. You know Our goal is always to resolve the protest prior to having the sale so that we have a really clear path forward that when we sell the parcel, we resolve that protest so we can we can get the money out and we can get that issued. But that whole that whole step takes approximately one year. And we just we've just planned on a year now because of just the criteria for getting that expression in. You want to you want to have the time to resolve it that you know there have been changes. But still, is if you don't get that fee submitted, we don't get that accounting that shows you submitted that fee, that expect to make sure we can work with folks to get that resolved because it's a learning process to get that submitted there and do all of it. So so we've made good progress, but but it is a it is a really a year process. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think there's a I I certainly believe there's a public person. I'd I like to hear your opinion on that. And then also how fast do you uh, authorize a, uh, a land lease situation, if I'm using the right words, for renewables. How quickly does that happen now compared to what it happened prior to this new change of the uh, American Recession Act? Thank you. Uh, Senator Cole, I, I would say there's been some new process steps put in place that uh, I, there was a significant delay 
in getting the new terms out and getting sale schedules set up. As uh, Chairman Boner pointed out there, we had a sale in June of 2022, and it took us a whole nother year. And, and part of that is that understanding is, you know, I want to give credit to headquarters. They worked a lot with everybody to show folks that you can't just say, oh, let's have a sale next month. It doesn't happen that way. So so we have put that together and we've got a schedule put together. It 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 takes a year and that's longer than most folks would like. They'd probably prefer two or three months, but the year in reality is when you put in required comment dates, when you put in required protest dates, when you put all that together, it just works out, works out to a year. Uh, regarding most renewable energy right away approval, IL, because going through the process of getting the required plan of development for us to go over the plan of development, which identifies those cross priority core habitat, you know, that's not going to be allowed in there, et cetera. So get your plan of development. We work through that process. Once we've got that BLM process taken care of, then we fold in working with the state agencies and the and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, because almost all of our projects have significant eagle issues associated with them. So you've got that process together just to get your turbine layouts done. Then you start through the NEPA process. You've got cultural reviews, et cetera. So I have to say them have been, have been fast. You can offer a right-of-way grant, let alone approve it. So, so they don't happen really quickly. As to follow up, have you ever not disapproved a project for the killing of eagles? Has that ever been an impediment for a wind project? Is that something you do or is that Fish and Wildlife that does those permits? So, uh, Senator Cole, so as part of the process, there's an incidental take that I'm going to say it, it's a mix here. And this is like a very unclear answer in that when you have a project that's a mix of private lands and public lands, a lot of the private land, we don't have any regulatory authority. They've got a voluntary incidental take, which I think a lot of folks now understand the importance of doing that and starting getting that. As far as on the BLM side, I mentioned early, we fold in the Fish and Wildlife Service very early. So number one, we can do we can incorporate that avoidance and minimization to get there. And then they're part of a joint NEPA process. And I, I will say is they have their own, as part of that process, they have an incidental take calculation that's associated with it that can move you into significance that may mean you have to make adjustments that may mean the project won't be approved. As far as any BLM projects so far, we've not we've not got to that point where the Eagle take has got to to the to the point where we're going to need to deny a project because there's a lot of built in. There's there's potential mitigation. There's also now a lot of the technology that can come in that they can uh, what you know, I won't use any brand names. We're not supposed to use it, but that can they can sit there and scan. And if certain raptors show up, it can slow a turbine. It can stop a turbine until they get out of the area. So there's a variety of ways of looking at it. But but the key one right off the bat is the avoidance and minimization. And and as a starting point, uh, you know, Fish and Wildlife Service has some fairly big avoidance that they try and incorporate. But the reality sometimes is is maybe you can't do all of it and still have a viable project. And so they're willing to work with folks to try and come up with a methodology to do it. Now, will they say that we're starting to approach some probably critical thresholds for the whole Rocky Mountain population? Yeah, they, they've said that. I don't know when that point is reached. They, they'll need to make that decision. Other questions? Uh, Chairman Heyer. Chairman. Mr. Spencer, that brings up a question about incidental takes. Uh, obviously, we allow incidental takes for alternative energy, wind turbines specifically. What about oil and gas? Is there such a thing as incidental take for oil and gas for raptors? Uh, Representative Heiner, we have, we have uh, never incorporated uh, incidental take into our oil and gas permitting process. I, I will say in some of our environmental impact statements, Eagle Take has been analyzed and there have been mitigation measures incorporated, you know, such, you know, sometimes the anti-perch deterrent there, some of the way they configure uh, electrical wiring so that, so the birds can't perch and touch multiple wires. There are some of that, but, but typically we have not incorporated any incidental take into the uh, application for permit to drill process. Follow up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, Mr. Spencer, it seems like there is a disparity there on how we treat different uh, uses. 
uh, you know, from my experience in the oil and gas business, there is there is no tolerance whatsoever for a take. Whereas for alternative energy, because that's a favorable uh, energy source, we allow raptors such as eagles to, as incidental takes. So it, it doesn't seem like we're grading these on the same level playing field. Uh, we're 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 having preferential treatment for one energy source over another. Is that true? Uh, Representative Heiner, I, I really can't respond to it in, in that manner. What I can respond to is when we deal with oil and gas operators, uh, a lot of times we've, we've never moved down that path where they want to move forward and say, let's go down the incidental the incidental take. As you know, all of our resource management plan planning is put together. It identifies the avoidance and minimization for oil and gas and other typically most other activities that we want to do to avoid take so we don't so we don't move into that and that's how the program has been approached i don't know for certain the process that if we had a project and they want to go forward and say you know we're going to do take let's do it not incidental take we're going to do deliberate take and that's the difference incidental take versus deliberate take and i'm on the edge of what i can really talk about with take without having fish and wildlife service do it here, but the difference between direct and plan take is not acceptable for any program. That does not move forward. It's all incidental take is what they're dealing with. And that's the distinction. Eric Holt. Mr. Chairman, do you have any numbers on the number of uh, eagles, raptors, I guess I'll just use that word instead of an eagle, that have uh, died in annually, you know, currently in the state of Wyoming. I mean, maybe that's a, you're the wrong person to ask, but being that we are watching this, and I, and I don't, I don't like the word take. I'll tell you why is because it gives people a false sense of uh, sounds better than killing. Well, they're dead. They're dead either which way, right? Uh, you call it what you like. I call it you killed. They died, and uh, sure they weren't gunning for them, but they died anyway when they were flying around the turbine blades. So, how many do get killed annually in the state of Wyoming? Anybody know? Uh, the, the fish and wildlife are. Senator Culp, the Fish and Wildlife Service would have those numbers. Yeah. I'm sensing a separate topic at our next meeting, uh, but uh, yeah, so, but yeah, we'll try to focus on the uh, oil and gas issue here. And uh, okay, any further questions? Okay, thanks, appreciate Thank it. You. Looking forward Thank to you, some of that information. And uh, I'm sure we'll keep on talking about this topic for a while. Yeah. Okay, next up we have the Petroleum Association. Mr. Obermiller, welcome back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members, Pete Obermuller, Petroleum Association of Wyoming. Uh, Mr. Chairman, what I thought I'd do is just uh, give a very brief overview of where we are on, uh, on leasing. And then I wanted to just uh, uh, talk about three topics. I want to um, mention lease deferrals, uh, which will go into the what you were talking about on expressions of interest and uh, et cetera. I want to talk about uh, the BLM's current practice of self-enjoining. And, uh, and then I want to just give you a very brief update on three major pieces of, of litigation that we're involved in. If that's okay, Mr. Chairman, I'll answer any other questions you might have. Uh, so very quickly on the um, just on the on the overall where are we at with leases in, in Wyoming, uh, we have Wyoming has currently has 12,051 total oil and gas leases. Uh, of those, uh, 7,326 are producing, and 4,725 are considered non-producing leases. The non-producing leases, of course, is a favorite talking point of the Biden administration. Um, they like to believe that those can be produced immediately, um, uh, the available and uh, ready to drill uh, language. Um, 2,573 of those non-producing leases are leases under litigation currently. And uh, that will get, get into that a little bit more when we talk about the self-enjoining. Um, there's a number of re reasons why the, the rest, the remaining, may not be producing, um, but which can include, of course, um, moving forward with uh, environmental review processes, um, uh, putting together um, a an actual drillable lease acreage, as I was mentioning to you this morning, uh, having to fit that puzzle piece together um, uh, because you know expressions of interest do not 
result in an actual release of that of all of those acreage for bidding even in the in the prior um prior regime prior to ira there's lots of expressions of interest um there's there's really there's no discernible reason why things get picked for a bidding and not from an expression of interest standpoint we don't have a good explanation for that so there's just little pockets here and there and and uh and you just hope for the best um and now um with the five dollar expression of interest of course yeah that's true that will result in, in fewer amount of acres being um uh expressed for interest um but the other side of that is there's a now that there's a monetary amount attached to the uncertainty of whether or not leases will be offered and more importantly whether leases will be deferred that's a very big question so um on the deferral side i'll just jump right into that right now uh one second here and i will find it make sure i have the numbers right so um in june of 22 so recall there were no leases offered in 2021 um, by the Biden administration, whole year without it. 2022, there was one. June of 2022, there was um, uh, 78, nearly 79% of the acres on the initial proposal list were deferred, 440,000 acres deferred. Um, June of 2023, uh, nearly 50% were deferred so far. Um, and then the September 23, so far, nearly 30% of uh, uh, were deferred. And the December 2023, uh, about 10% are deferred from much smaller numbers. Uh, so what does deferred mean? Uh, it, it is essentially, it's, it's, not, it's not that they said, no, these are not available to, to lease. A, a company gives an expression of interest, and um, usually it goes out to the field office. The field office sends data back to the state office about, yeah, these you know, here's the things that could happen with stipulations. These acres aren't available, et cetera, et cetera. And so you say, no, we're, we can't do these leases. They're not available. These are available. They've just been deferred. So they're in this bucket over here of available acreage where there's been an expression of interest and, and, and nearly 600,000 acres since 2022 are in this deferral bucket with no uh, discernible process for how to get them out of that bucket. So the December 2023 one would be the first one, I believe, that would be subject to that $5 fee, um, September 2023 and December, I guess. So uh, 28,168 acres in September uh, that paid the $5 per acre fee in this bucket with no process to get it out of that bucket. We, we don't know how to, wh 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 when, how, how do we do it? What criteria do we have to meet? Um, what 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 can be done? We don't we don't know. We don't have an answer to that. And um, uh, so we're trying to uh, we have we have raised those questions because we have uh, we have commented now on every lease sale since 2022 to ask these questions. What what are the criteria for deferrals? What how, how did you decide it? How can we move it out of there later? And and we don't have answers to those questions. So. Uh, that, that that's a big frustration with respect to uh with respect to leasing um before i move into self and joining I'll, I'll answer questions but i also before it slips my mind mr chairman i just wanted to answer your question about uh number of acres leased over the past 15 263,000 in 2018 521,000 in 2019 1.2 million in 2020 uh which completed the previous administrations about 568 2021 zero in 2022 65,000 acres 2023 is unknown until we get through december so moving to the self and join going back to those number of leases under litigation let's make sure that i have this here so over the past five or six years or so, 21 lease sales in Wyoming have been litigated encompassing about 2.1 million acres. Um, in some of those cases, um, the BLM or the court has said, has told BLM you can't move forward. Uh, but in many of those cases, covering a significant amount of acreage, the court has not enjoined the BLM from issuing APDs 
or from processing what we call sundries and you know sort of minor changes um, uh, to either the surface or downhole locations. Uh, they have not required that the BLM not uh, not issue those, not process those, and the BLM is uh, is not doing it anyway. Um, out of fear of, uh, of further litigation, out of um, fear of the of, uh, outcome of current litigation, not, not precisely sure, but they're not court ordered to not act, and they're not acting. Uh, at that, that's a source of a significant frustration um, that uh, just recently Governor Gordon sent a letter to the, to the BLM uh, director asking about that um, uh, refusal to process uh, uh, sundries uh, and and APDs in litigated leases where they have not been required to do so. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll just stop on on those two before I move to litigation. There's so much more to say, but I I'm super cognizant of your time right now. So, that update, I think that's very helpful. Uh, committee, any questions? Okay, go ahead, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Pete, thanks for the. Uh... A little update here. So is there, how do I ask this? Do operators prefer to work on BLM versus private? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Tarver, uh, private is better nine times out of 10, maybe 10 times out of 10. Uh, could you uh, explain a little bit why that is? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Tarver, I, I think you probably know. I mean, the um, the speed at, with which we, we can move through the permitting process and uh, and come to agreement is just, um, you know, there's just no comparison. Um, the bureaucratic hurdles, uh, uh, you know, et cetera. So the, um, you're probably familiar um, with the Converse County EIS project in, uh, in Converse County, um, notably. Um, you know, that took, that took seven years to develop. And there's just, you, you know, you're a businessman, you know that, Things change in seven years. Economics change in seven years. So, you know, dealing with the federal government, particularly in uh, when the administration changes and um, the landscape changes, the uncertainty is so high, the expense is so high, the the, the time value of of money is uh, is uh, it's very costly. So, uh, yeah, it's just it, it's it's difficult, and it puts us at a competitive disadvantage in Wyoming. No problem. So that brings me to my next question as an operator. Uh, for one, why would I want to lease BLM? Secondly, I get the lease. There's no guarantee I'll get a permit. So we're going up against several different things here that are to a dis major disadvantage in Wyoming. We have a lot of BLM and uh, how do we promote our operators to lease BLM land when there's really absolutely no advantage to it. Yeah, um, Mr. Chairman, Representative Tarver, I I think you just explained why Wyoming's rig count is what it is compared to Oklahoma and others. It's not that we don't have the resource, we do. The Powder River Basin is uh, is a major play with a very desirable resource. Uh, but it takes a um, it takes a certain kind of company willing to willing to do it. Um, uh, you know, it's not just it's not just monetary resources. It's um, it's understanding, it's skill, it's it's willingness to work with all these partners uh, to make it happen on federal lands. Uh, and 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 it takes very skilled operators that can um, drill very complicated wells that are able to still make some amount of money despite all those uh, those added costs it's it, it, it's tough we're at a competitive disadvantage there's no doubt chairman mr obermuller we've heard some some testimony about the inflation reduction act and the the way it raised prices on numerous aspects of oil and gas leasing and drilling uh, specifically, the expression of interest costs went up exponentially, but it also the royalty rates went up. Mm -hmm. So as you compare all these cost change, the changes in costs, which was the most difficult for your industry to uh, to 
take on? Was it the royalty increase or the interest, the cost of expression of interest? Which one was most difficult to ballot? You know, Mr. Chairman, Co-Chairman Heiner, that's, that's a great question. And I think if you had all my members up here, they'd probably have a different answer. It kind of depends on what your goal is, uh, what your business plan is, what what's most difficult. So obviously, raising the cost of, of, of actual production, the royalty rates, all those sorts of things are going are gonna to eat into that. I, I can tell you what I what frustrates me the most, and maybe it frustrates me because it really only impacts Wyoming, and so nobody else understands it, and we're too small, so who cares? Um, but I, I think what the IRA did, and what a lot of what the what the national BLM is doing, is um, choking off our ability uh, to be entrepreneurial, to find the new resources, to um, to take a, a great place, test the outer edges of it. Um, or the or the northern DJ. So expression of interest is one of those things. Uh, you know, you now that you have to pay for it, there's a little less incentive now to be, uh, you know, for for some upstart to say, I, I think there's something there. You know, the way that the Jonah field was built. It's not like we didn't know that there was a resource in the Jonah field, we knew we just couldn't get it out it never worked. Until finally, somebody actually had had an idea and it worked. Uh, and that that, 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 that entrepreneurial aspect of the early part of leasing is what a lot of this took away, non-competitive leasing. Um, that, that's a big impact for Wyoming that I really regret was in that bill, is that the non-competitive leasing indicates that like there was, um, there's a great play and nobody knew about sole source or something like that. Non-competitive is because it went to the bidding process and everybody thought, there's nothing there, I'm not going to bid on that piece of dirt. And some geologists said, I think there's something there. I'm going to bid on it and, and it's going to turn into something. Nine times out of 10, it didn't. But we still paid for the right after getting the lease and the rentals and all of that. So without that, our ability to be entrepreneurial and explore for new resources in Wyoming, I think that's very intentional and I regret that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's maybe a probably an unfair question to ask, but what do you think the legislative body can do here in the state of Wyoming to help you? Is there, you got any ideas? I mean, you're an expert as I'll give you that. Uh, what's your thoughts? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator Kolb. I, I, I do have an idea there and it's actually an excellent segue for me to just go right into my litigation thing. So maybe I'll just power through that. That I'll answer that question. Does that sound okay? So, Lots and lots of litigation. I'm only going to cover three. It's the three that PAW is actively involved in. Um, I won't bore you into details with all the you know various jargon, but um, uh, in with our partners, the Western Energy Alliance. Uh, this is the one where we, we were actually we're co-plaintiffs with the Western Energy Alliance, um, suing the Biden administration for not doing quarterly lease sales as they're required to do under the Mineral Leasing Act. Um, we filed it initially way back in in, in the second quarter um, of of 2021 after they missed the first uh, notice to do the first lease sale. We knew they were going to miss that one. Uh, that uh, was thrown out by Judge Skovdal basically on a timing and a procedural issue, not not really on the merits. Uh, and so um, rather than appeal on that one, we decided to take a step back and file a new suit. And in fact, we file a complaint every time that the BLM misses one now so that we can clear that hurdle from Judge Scott. We basically took, because Judge Scott gave us the arguments about why that didn't work and sort of the roadmap about what to do. And so that, so we're following that. And that's, that's um, back to sort of its early stages now because we filed now, I think three or four complaints after, after missed uh, leases after that. The second one is, um, uh, the Center for Biological Diversity versus uh, DOI, and that is, um, we are defendant interveners. Um, they have sued, uh, obviously, the, the DOI, seeking to overturn every single oil and gas permit issued in Wyoming and New Mexico since 2021. So every every permit issued by President Biden's administration, they're seeking to overturn. Uh, uh, for various arguments, most of them you've heard, but, but a lot of very novel arguments about um, how the BLM did not you know, carefully analyze enough how uh, the impact of one single well in Converse County, uh, their impact on an endangered bird in Hawaii, or that sort of thing. Uh, 
Um, so uh, we're defending on that. That is um, kind of the pre-trial motions that there are done. It's got just an, it's an enormous administrative record. So it's going to be paused for a while while the federal government compiles the administrative record. There's 900 or so um, uh, permits in Wyoming, but there's 3,000 or something in New Mexico. We've filed on that to, to separate the two uh, and uh, send Wyoming's to Wyoming District Court, and New Mexico can deal with theirs in, in part to help deal with that massive administrative record. Uh, the third is the Powder River Basin Resource Council um, versus uh, BLM. Um, this one, we're also defendant interveners, and uh, this is the one where the Powder River Basin Resource Council has filed to, uh, they want the BLM to vacate the Converse County uh, EIS project that I mentioned before, and to vacate every permit issued under that uh, that uh, EIS issued uh, in 2020. Uh, so that one is is still in. Um, uh, well, the most uh, timely thing about that is is the Powder Basin Resource Council filed to uh, ask the court to halt all activity there to enjoin it. Um, until the end of that. Um, we, of course, oppose that. The judge, who's the uh, DC judge um, who has no history on, on oil and gas issues or natural resource issues, set a hearing for that later in July. Uh, but if that motion is granted, um, that's not good. So um, we're fighting that. So all that, that's where we are on those three things. And all those in, in, in all of those, the state of Wyoming is a part of it. Uh, they're also defendant interveners. Uh, uh, and the AG's office has been a great partner on this, and they uh, they have good staff on it. And um, by staff, I mean singular, uh, and that is a bit of a problem. And so, to answer your question, Senator Cole, honestly, the best thing that you can do is to make sure that the Environment and Natural Resources Division of the State AG's office has every tool and every person paid whatever they need to to, to do these fights. Uh, and, and I say that, and you chuckle, Representative Tarver, but I say that because they're not paid what they need. We can't, we can't, we can't get uh, enough and, and, and uh, we can't get the lawyers we need there to fight Wyoming's fights. And uh, so Federal Natural Resource Policy Account, which you all tend to be the best champions of, does that, but there's other ways through appropriations, et cetera. I, I don't know that she doesn't need anyone. Um, I, I think that's probably not true. I, I don't, she might, I, I shouldn't have said that. I'm not putting words in her mouth. She might say we need everyone. Um, uh, and, and, but they, they, I think they need every resource that you can possibly give them to help Wyoming fight these fights because they are not going to stop. And um, uh, the association can only get involved in a very small fraction of them because of the resources involved in doing so. Uh, so be basically, did you say the state is, or are you saying we should try to help them financially, whatever, to uh, arm them with more lawyers, perhaps? Is that, uh, would that be the best or? Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Tarver, yeah, I, I mean, they're, they're doing the very best I can. The, the current uh, attorney there is, is awesome. Um, really great to work with, does a great, great job is one. Uh, and, and these are what? Yeah, yeah, he needs help, I think. I think he would say that as well, not because he's not capable. It's just only so much one guy can do. I, I, I almost sure to think how much that salary is versus the, the dollar figure associated with, say, shutting down the power of a basin for an interim amount of time, uh, just to the state of Wyoming, much less everybody else that's affected by it. I, I, yeah, I, I think that... I, I don't even want to do that math. It's probably kind of scary, that, that ratio. Um, so, um, yeah, I think that's certainly something we could advocate for and, uh, you know, talk to our friends on the Appropriations Committee. As I'm, I'm sure they'll get tired of us eventually, but it won't be tomorrow. So, uh, um, so anyways, further questions for the Patrolman Association? Okay, well, I, I have a predictable one, I guess. We had House Bill 163 last year, um, got a little bit of traction, but then was uh, uh, met untimely demise by you know, House Appropriations Committee, just wondering would there still be the same amount of interest as before from your association in uh, legislation such as that? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. Okay, any questions? Okay, thank, thank you so you, much sir. for your Appreciate work. It. Appreciate it. Very important issue. 
Anybody online? Okay. No one's going twice. Public comment is closed. Committee? Um, we did mention House Bill 163. For those of you who are unfamiliar, that was a bill which would effectively um, do our best to blunt the impact of the royalty rate increase. Uh, there is an opportunity for the state to make adjustments there because we do get 49% of the federal royalties uh, back. And that is actually currently being baked into our Craig forecast, the increase in revenue that the state would realize due to this, um, I think overall in favor at the federal level um, and increasing the royalty rates. So um, that is one thing we can do, provide some stability in an unstable environment. I, I'd point out the local government is impacted as well. When you raise royalty rates, you decrease uh, ad valorem taxes. So your counties, your schools, your anything, you know, local weed and pest, that those would be negatively affected as well. So um, we could uh, have more discussion on sponsoring that bill again. I think uh, we got through the House Revenue Committee somehow, um, but then of course, House Appropriations uh, killed it um, as they did many bills, it would seem. Um, but, you know, I, I, I'm confident that there's a way we could continue to gain traction with that bill if we were to choose to sponsor it again. So that's one specific uh, item that we could do um, in addition to advocating for the AG's office, uh, Mr. Co-Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I, I make a, a motion that we bring back House Bill 163 for our next committee meeting and uh, solicit testimony with that bill. Uh, the merits of it. There is a point to our, our municipalities, our education department, and our state by spurring growth and redistributing some of that, that revenue. So I'd like to hear additional testimony on that to see if it would be an avenue which would spur growth in our oil and gas business and actually increase our uh, revenue for the state. Motion on the table. Second by Representative uh, Tarver. Any discussion? Senator Gold. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we also have the data specifics on why it was killed in House appropriations, so we can maybe modify it or tweak it in a way that would make it more higher, more likelihood to uh, make it through. Um, yeah, sure. There's there's several different concepts we can try and incorporate. Uh, one idea was, you know, verify that, you know, any of those refunds for the affected taxpayer are being used. There's at least an equal amount being used for put in, in production in the state of Wyoming. Um, there's an attempt to put a sunset date on. There was a sunset put on it in House appropriate or House revenue. Uh, there's a, a brief attempt in House appropriations to uh, adjust the uh, refund available to the affected taxpayer. Um, uh, there's all those options are on the table. Absolutely. Uh, I've, I've tried to engage with some of the, um, but, uh, but yeah, the, there's things we can do to try to bring more people in, but they, they have to be interested in doing it. Senator Ellis. Mr. Chairman, um, maybe some discussion on just knowing the jurisdictions of the committees. I mean, it's I just maybe playing devil's advocate. Is this really a federal natural resource issue or is this more of a revenue issue? I, I know people get really sensitive about turf. Clearly within the select committee's uh, purview, which is to respond to federal actions that affect Wyoming's economy. Um, we have had significant input from the Department of Revenue to make sure that the mechanics work, as well as your local uh, county treasurers, county assessors. Um, so from a technical standpoint, which I think, you know, is usually where we get in trouble, we start doing something that we don't understand exactly, don't have the expertise, but you can uh, adjust for that. And we have adjusted for that in previous years by uh, you know, working closely with our Department of Revenue in particular. Uh, so I, there's a, a clear nexus. And I, I've heard lots of arguments against the bill that has not been won yet. But yeah, we have to be prepared for that. Absolutely. Any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, say no. Okay, we'll get that bill drafted for our next meeting. Any other discussion, committee? Any discussion on the... Um, way forward with uh, making sure the AG is adequately staffed? Or is that just something we kind of informally advocate for? Or maybe for, maybe co-chairman and I go in front of the JC in December and uh, share that thought. But any, any, any thoughts that the committee has? Senator Ellis? Mr. Chairman, um, the TRW committee I know has asked the AG's office to do a presentation on litigation that they're involved in but more in understanding kind of some of the wildlife issues. Maybe that's something we could look at for next hearing is just hearing about staffing level levels. I know they had a deputy 
um, the deputy position for the Water and Natural Resources Division was vacant. I think it's recently been filled. I mean, we can get an update on some of that. That might be an idea of a starting point. Chairman, uh, it seems like it might be a good idea to ask the AG if they want help or not, and then uh, have them uh, propose what they think would be an improvement to the situation. Uh, so we uh, let them take lead on on what they feel like they they need to have for for uh, to fight these battles. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Further discussion on this topic or any other dealing with oil and gas. Go ahead, Representative Tarver. Thanks, Chairman. Uh, I'm more than willing to. Uh, I think we really need to look at supporting any pushback. Uh, I don't know if that's the right word or not, but pushback towards the federal government being uh, we had an excess amount of income and most of it came from the minerals industry. And uh, I'm in full support of giving back to the hand that feeds us any way we can. So. A further discussion committee. Okay, I guarantee this will be a topic at our next meeting, but for now, and of course, if you have any input in between, think of something later, feel free to contact the co-chairman. So, Okay, that being said, we'll move on to our 240 topic, only an hour behind schedule. Uh, talk about sage grouse. A little bit more, I should say. Proceed. Thank you, Representative Heiner. Regarding greater sage grouse planning, BLM Wyoming values our partnership with the state of Wyoming, Wyoming sage grouse implementation team, our local working groups, and of course, all the local governments and partners that work collaboratively on greater sage grouse protection efforts. Without these relationships, both our planning and greater sage grouse habitat restoration efforts would not be successful. As I'm sure you know, the BLM is currently considering amending our land use plans for greater sage grouse habitat management to account for new scientific information and address continued declines in sage grouse populations and loss of habitat. In addition, the Bureau's policy requires us to take proactive species so that they do not require federal protections, and this is per BLM Manual 6840. The current round of planning aims to conserve and manage greater sage grouse habitats on public lands to support persistent, healthy greater sage grouse populations consistent with BLM policy and in coordination with state governments. BLM in Wyoming is working with our partners to consider modifications to habitat management areas, boundaries and management, as well as assessing nominations for areas of critical environmental concern and other updates to reflect current information and research. We are continuing to work with the many cooperating agencies to develop a range of alternatives and analyze them in a draft environmental impact statement. The BLM hopes to publish the Notice of Availability for the Draft Environmental Impact Statement for this planning effort in fall 2023, and we look forward to working with all our partners in Wyoming throughout this planning effort. This has been an extremely productive partnership for the BLM and, and the department, and we are committed to continuing it, and we will take questions from here. It's about sage grass. Representative? Carver. Chairman. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, just curious, are we trying to add to the protection of the sage grouse uh, th through this, or are we just looking at it as of right now? That's a great question, Representative Tarver. We are looking at current scientific data and kind of what has occurred since the last iterations of the plan. And so I we don't have a decision on that yet. We, we still haven't released the draft environmental impact statement about that. And so we'll have a layer of variety of alternatives within that. Within that, With that being said, our staff has been meeting fairly regularly with Wyoming Game of Fish to kind of share data, share science, and really try to march forward together so that we're agreeing on core and um, primary habitat management areas within the state of Wyoming. So I can't say if we're looking at adding or subtracting because those final decisions haven't been made yet, but we are working very, very closely with Wyoming Game and Fish. They've been excellent. The state has been excellent partners in this, these discussions. Follow up. Chairman, uh, 
Well, we asked the question by numerous people asked the question about wild horses impacting sage grouse. And shockingly, through the miracle of the internet, and I'm sure Google search engine, lo and behold, the USGS has a report. And it unequivocally states, when unchecked, free roaming wild horse populations threaten greater sage grouse. I guess maybe you could, I guess, review that, please. I, I would appreci I appreciate your, like what your comments were on this. I realize maybe you don't have this, but the good Senator Ellis found this, and I'm just going to want to speak about it because I was shocked that you didn't have an answer first that this was studied because it was seemed to be a kind of a common sense thing, which isn't so common anymore, that uh, there's an impact. So we have, there's actually a study <laughs> right here that uh, addresses this. So could you, I guess, maybe uh, review that? I, I, would, I would ask if you look at this and tell me what your comments were on said um, statements. Thank you, Senator Kolb. I, you know, I'm not personally familiar with that report, but we will definitely talk with our resource and our planning people to see if they're familiar with the report and if that's part of what's being incorporated into the science and the data going forward as we move through this plan. I, I don't have the answer to that. I'm, Mr. Purdy captured that we have captured that and we will get back to you. I'm, I was not familiar with that plan, so thank you. Chairman, thank you. Well, it looks like we might be able to kill two birds with one stone here. If we take care of the horse population, the sage grouse problem might go away. Just an observation there. Thank you, Representative Tarver. About a decade or maybe even longer than that ago, we commissioned a study in this southwest Wyoming to evaluate the sage grouse uh, population and why it was decreasing at that time and we commissioned a university study. And what they determined was it wasn't so much loss of habitat as it was ravens, uh, depredation. So, you know, with the raven population becoming uh, exponentially growing over the past number of years, uh, you know, they, they are able to find the eggs and, and uh, you know, take out the uh, sage grouse before they're even hatched. So are we looking at science in the wrong way? Are we, we, we focused on this habitat reduction when in actuality we have depredation by wild horses and ravens and raptors and, and other things that, uh, you know, fox, coyote, whatever it may be, that may be the overriding problem rather than just habitat. Thank you, Representative Heiner. I can't speak specifically to which you know, scientific topics. I'm definitely not the subject matter expert on the scientific topics we're evaluating. You said that report was done about a decade ago. I would presume some of that science would have been perhaps incorporated into the first effort. I don't know for sure, but would have been incorporated into the first effort with sage grouse in 2015. And then we had another effort in 2019. So I know there's, there's, significant amounts of science that, again, our subject matter experts and the state of Wyoming subject matter experts have been getting to, I mean, to like impressive degrees sometimes where I, when I see some of the presentations, it's mind blowing what they've been analyzing and looking at. So I can't specifically speak to the raven predation piece, but I'm hopeful that 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 science, if that was completed over a decade ago, is incorporated into this first round and is part of this larger thing, but we can certainly provide you an answer on that because I don't know specifically regarding that issue. Other questions, please? Senator Cole. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. To follow up with that last question, particularly, uh, could you identify all the other things that aren't associated with habitat when it comes down to the the, the uh, issue with populations and sage grouse. I mean, it's a broad thing. I mean, it could be ravens. Uh, I, I, I think there's many things it may be, but I certainly want to think about something more than just the habitat. I mean, I think that's really closing off a whole line of questions. I mean, if you focus only on one thing, that's all you're going to look at. So I, I would certainly be interested to seeing what else has been considered in totality for the degradation of the sage grouse population. Yeah, thank you, Senator Kolb. And I think a, a couple of things breaking that down, you know, when the when the draft environmental impact statement comes out in um, in the fall, I believe it's like late fall, early winter, I think is what the information I have most current information I have, there should be there should be analysis of the data that has been considered 
And I think there will be uh, specific references to the 2015 and the 2019 plans. Those plans are also available online. And there's, there's analysis of data that are included in those plans. It kind of provides this broader generality. And again, I don't have them all memorized, but provides a broader generality of the data that was considered and evaluated when putting those plans together. So that, that information is publicly available for the prior plans and then will be available when the draft comes out for public comment this fall. Further discussion committee, any questions? Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. We'll look forward to that update. Thank you, time. Chairman. Okay. Any public comment on sage grouse at this point? Do we have anybody online? It looks like we have the county commissioners come on down. And while they're doing that, do we have anybody online? Okay. Sounds good. Mr. Christensen, welcome back. Thank you very, <clears throat> thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, I know you are crunched on time, but I did want you to know that uh, the County Commissioners Association uh, is participating in not only uh, CIGIS work uh, with local working groups and their mapping effort, but also with the BLM as a cooperating agency. Um, we have 19 of the 23 uh, counties in Wyoming serving as cooperating agency uh, agencies right now, and uh, 16 of those counties are working together as, as a sort of a county collective, uh, which will do a few things. One, it'll help uh, fo focus the county voice uh, and, and, and in that process, uh, but also uh, is allowing for counties that may not be able to participate in these processes, whether that's due to financial or time constraints, and give them a better opportunity to get their you know, step into that pool. Um, our objective, of course, is to ensure that we're being productive members of that cooperating agency relationship, uh, supporting the effort uh, with BLM and other state agencies in creating a, a plan amendment that is uh, going to be successful, uh, not only for the habitat of the bird, but also sent up in court. Um, if you have been watching sage grouse plan amendments in the last several years, you'll note that none of them seem to escape alive um, from litigation. And so our effort will be to uh, focus on making sure we have a, a, a solid uh, plan going forward. Um, because as you noted, uh, probably with, with uh, Pete Obermuller's testimony earlier, uh, Wyoming spends a lot of money, not just fighting against federal actions, but also defending them. And uh, that's because we actually work hard with our federal agencies. I think it's a good thing to keep in mind that we work uh, to defend those actions often as well. And so uh, this is just a good effort. I think I heard a lot of good things from BLM today and just wanted you to know that the counties are very engaged right now in, in sage grouse. So thank you. Thank you. Just a question on which counties aren't participating in this. <laughs> so uh, if you look at a sage grouse map and where we have uh, a lot of sagebrush habitat, you'll note in the south east corner of our state, uh, Albany, Laramie, uh, Goshen, and Platte. Uh, that there isn't much habitat there, and, and therefore those counties have opted not to participate in this process. Okay, thank you for your organization's continued efforts. Thank you. Okay. Representative Knapp, come on down. Uh, just from the aspect of my constituents on this issue, um, it is very frustrating. Um, we know that the habitat will be looked at and and there's a good chance that industry will be affected by this and it um, costs an enormous amount of money to fight and defend. Um, while at the same time, we mentioned eagles uh, earlier today. And last year in a courtroom in Cheyenne, uh, the largest when a company was charged with killing 150 eagles, both golden and bald, um, birds roughly per year, about 500,000 birds a year, 300 golden eagles a year. Um, and there's not one study is affected by the killing of or taking of these birds. So I just wanna, wanna represent the frustration that uh, many in the mineral industry feel um, I know if if there was a eagle's nest at one of the mines, the mine would shut down until that that is resolved. Um, 
And so it, it is a frustrating situation to, to have this um, with a bird that is typically gone in cycles in population itself. Um, so it's tough to keep sage grouse alive in captivity <laughs> um, with uh, programs that we've had in trying to breed the bird. So just wanted to reflect that frustration amongst the constituents. Thank you. It's Representative Knapp. It's not if he just leaves, but. <laughs> okay, any further public comment on the sage grouse issue? Okay, looks like public comment is closed on this topic committee. Any further discussion or motions? All right, sounds good. Yeah, part of what this committee does is we become educated on these important issues so we can share it with our colleagues. So that's, oh, go ahead. So I went to, oh, thank you, Chairman. I went to one of these meetings and uh, they did talk about oil and gas as being the biggest uh, problem with the sage grouse. We didn't talk about fox. We didn't talk about coyotes. We didn't talk about any predators, ravens, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we seem to be, and I think, uh, I don't know if it was you or, or Senator Cole that alluded, we seem to be focused on it's only one problem. And I think that's something everyone should uh, be thinking about. We, the discussion didn't even open up to the predator problem. So it would be interesting to see the difference, say, when you ban certain chemicals for, uh, you know, controlling uh, uh, predatory birds, for example, I thought we saw corresponding decrease in the sage grouse population, for example, it'd be not proven, but there's definitely a strong correlation there. So, and it does remind some other issues that we've had on this committee, say with migration corridors, where lo and behold, all the studies for some reason on migration corridors to deal with oil and gas development, when we all know that, you know, everybody having a lower 40 acre piece of heaven outside of town, subdividing previously open ground seems to have a bigger impact. But uh, um, yeah, it seems to be, uh, it takes years, it seems, to build these narratives, and there are studies that, that support those narratives with that in mind, it would seem, and this isn't the only issue, unfortunately. It seems to uh, target a particular industry. So any further discussion? Senator Cole. Yeah, Chairman, I'd just like to add about the raptors. I, I think the unique biology with those uh, birds, they're very slow to reproduce, and, and once you devastate a population or have an impact, it, it's, a, it's felt for a long time. And, I, and I, that's what I'm mostly concerned about. I mean, it turned a blind eye because we're all of a sudden so concerned about the so-called renewables and how, how it's so good. But yet, for an action that if I went out and shot an eagle, I'd, it's a federal charge, I believe. And yet, you can whack them up and chop them up and knock them on the ground and count them as a, as a, uh, a fatality of uh, the great green energy revolution. And I just don't believe in that. I, I think it's, I think we don't look at it fairly and it's just not fair. So I, I just would uh, like to know more about, uh, I guess, if there is something we can do. And I, I don't know. I'm certainly, I appreciate the information though, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Senator Ellis. Mr. Chairman, I just want to offer some comments on that. Um, you know, the word take is a term of art used in the Endangered Species Act, and it's meant to encompass something broader than just killing the animal. You know, if you're trying to harass an animal, maybe you tried to kill it, but you were unsuccessful. I mean, that term is meant to cover something broader. And so I understand the, the point that maybe, you know, the perception that, you know, benefits from that. But the, the difference you just described of um, going out there with your intent to go kill an endangered species is different than something that, it, that lacks maybe the intent. So even if you disagree with that, like the Endangered Species Act does contemplate, like if you're out in the wilderness and you encounter a grizzly and it's you or the grizzly because you weren't going out there with the intent to kill it, you were defending your life. So I just want to be a little cautious and, and just think, just thinking about the word intent and why that language is there. And it, it works there in positive ways too. Um, so just a thought. One more comment and we, we do have to move on at some point. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I'll, I'll defend my point of view about take, and I'll say this. You got a tip speed of 120 miles an hour on those turbines, and you're a raptor flying around. I feel it would be just ludicrous to think that wasn't going to develop into the death of said bird. Uh, that's my point of saying that. No, a gun isn't out there shooting them and aiming for them 
but you've in fact set up a situation where it's inevitable, inevitable, they will be killed. And that's why I think it's appropriate to use the word they, they were killed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, so we'll move on. Um, State Fair land exchange. Um, Bilam, you're up uh, first, and then uh, I think we have Representative Nat. We probably should put you on the agenda. You'll, you'll go after the BLM. How about that, Representative? And then we'll move on. Okay, come, come on down. Chairman? So regarding the state and federal land exchange process, um, I believe we've been asked to comment on the right of first refusal of the proposed state legislature bill. And as you may know, the BLM cannot provide testimony on the specifics of a proposed bill in the Wyoming legislature, but I can provide the committee a brief overview of the BLM's land exchange process. Is that sufficient? Okay. So land exchanges are an important tool that can be used to consolidate land ownership for more efficient management and to facilitate and promote the BLM's multiple use and sustained yield mission. Most land exchange proposals are initiated by non-federal parties and are fully developed. through. They typically involve a substantial investment of time and resources by both federal and non-federal parties and are often highly complex. If the land exchange proposal is accepted as a result of the feasibility assessment, the BLM will determine the processing costs, which would be outlined in an agreement with the exchange party. There are a number of detailed steps to complete the land exchange, including appraisals, surveys, NEPA analysis, final negotiations, and other tasks as outlined in federal laws, regulations, and BLM policy prior to finalizing the transfer and issuing patents. Land exchanges are a tool the BLM utilizes when considering land management for the benefit of the American public. We continue to strive to refine this complex process and look forward to working with proponents, including the state of Wyoming, for potential future land exchange opportunities. I'd also like to quickly discuss the Land and Water Conservation Fund, LWCF, which was established in 1965 and provides funding to agencies like the BLM for the acquisition of land for the benefit of public lands and waters. The Great American Outdoors Act of 2020 requires the president's annual budget submission to Congress to include a proposed allocation of LWCF funding as part of the appropriation process. For fiscal year 2023, the Department of Interior proposes to allocate just under 71 million for BLM LWCF programs. When an LWCF CF acquisition occurs, it is not uncommon for a landowner to sell their property to a private party and then have that party complete the LWCF acquisition with the BLM. Open it up for questions. Questions on this land exchange process for the BLM. Now, Chairman Hunter. Mr. Chairman, uh, Ms. Kirby, uh, the exchanging properties, uh, I, I see the reason for that. You know, there's there's ways to make it more efficient by exchanging property with uh, to consolidate ownership, make it more manageable. But uh, what I am concerned with is the, you know, we, here in Wyoming, we have almost 50% of our land is owned by the public, by federal government right now. And recently we saw where the BLM was uh, trying to acquire another ranch that uh, increases their holdings here within the state. And we were cognizant of that. We're aware of the implications that has as the, the bureaucracy in, in Washington controls more and more of our state, our state lands. And we have the same concerns with uh, foreign ownership of our, of our state because some of the, the decisions are made outside of the state that are not always conducive to the best interests of our citizens and our state as a whole. So uh, that, that's what concerns me is the increased, the exchange process I have no problem with. The increased holdings of the federal government, I do have a concern with. Uh, I would like the opportunity for, first of all, the public to be aware of this happening during the process and not as a last minute uh, uh, being aware of it. Uh, oh, by the way, we did this. And also given the, give the state an opportunity to weigh in. Now, I don't want to stop the private landowners from the opportunity of selling their property. Mm -hmm. That is... That is a right that we all hold as property owners to be able to, to free exchange of property rights. But I just would like the state to be more involved with that process and uh, 
I, I'd like your opinion on that. Is there a way that the state can be more involved uh, in an open discussion rather than at the 11th hour? I'm gonna actually defer that. Can I defer that to you, Mr. Spencer? <laughs> so we're very, we're very cognizant of the state of Wyoming involvement and we have an overall agreement with the state for them to be cooperating agencies on every NEPA document that we prepare. Uh, we, we've definitely refocused everybody that when it comes to the issue of, of land acquisition, land exchanges, land disposal, definitely we need to coordinate early and often with the state. We, we definitely have that as an active topic at our state office. We we meet monthly with the governor's office, governor's staff, and we go over things like this. So, so definitely we, we've increased that emphasis to make sure that happens early and often. And I think part of the process, part of the problem that we've really discovered is most of these take place over many, many years. And so you have communication, then you go into a law while we're going through a lot of the BLM processes. Then they come up again, we're a more public process. And you go through another basically internal property closing. Then you go through another public process. So it's keeping that active engagement the entire time is, is very important. We have also sat down as a state management team that the state director was very cognizant is that we have lands identified for disposal. You know, what can we do to invigorate that? What are we looking at and, and how do we make that more, more successful? Because we've talked about with this committee over the years, the difficulties with doing exchanges and the difficulty with, with even disposals because you have requirements for, for paying, you know, the appraised value for that when you get it, you know, and if you're a landlocked piece of land, you're using it for grazing, you're paying a, a fairly small use for your grazing permit every year. Is it really benefit you then to come in and pay full appraisal value to get that, even though we think it's a management, a management benefit for us to get rid of that parcel. But you start looking through that and go, wow, I'm, I'm paying, I'm just making up numbers. I'm maybe paying $200 a year for my grazing fee. But if I buy that, that's going to be five or 600 bucks an acre, which is going to take me about a thousand years to recoup that difference there. So that's some of the difficulties we've been trying to figure out are there different strategies to go through to dispose because we've got a lot of lands that we've identified we want to dispose of. So trying to fit all the pieces together has been, you know, we're really focused in on that, but the engagement is, is very clear. We definitely have emphasized to everybody more often, early, often, and keep it going. Mr. Spencer, I appreciate your comments. Over the past few years, have you had an increase in, in, in land ownership within the state of Wyoming or a decrease? We've had an increase, Representative Hyer. Okay, any questions? Okay, appreciate your input. And, uh, Thank you. I'll go too far. Okay, Representative Knapp, uh, we'll go and switch up a little bit uh, and then we'll get to state lands. Uh, now you had a specific uh, bill dealing with this issue um, last session. And I'd just like to give you the opportunity to come on and uh, provide your perspective. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, committee. <laughs> Within one week of being sworn in, Joe Biden signed an executive order called the America the Beautiful Initiative, so-called 30, 30 by 30 on the basis not of conservation, but on the basis of climate change. This would require an added conservation land roughly equivalent to the size of Texas. At that point, he promised an allocation of $1 billion to match conservation groups. The 1976 Federal Land Policy and Management Act allows for the federal government to acquire, exchange, or divest properties. It requires them to ensure that newly acquired property fits local land use plans and that it grants local cooperating agency status to local governments. What does this mean for Wyoming? 48% of land is owned by the federal government. The BLM manages 42.9 million acres of federal mineral, mineral estate. We saw the one example of the Morton Ranch at 35,000 acres, which did not necessarily follow the process. The governor was concerned about losing grazing rights and mineral interests. Conservation is not what it used to mean. Conservation used to mean wildlife, 
protecting the environment and the ecosystem. As conservation has grown, it's now corporations, government, and conservation all become one. Conservation has become human-based, not wildlife-based. One of the largest conservation groups is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, another largely funded by the left. Walmart is now the largest owner of private underground water resources. BlackRock has entered the industry. Conservation now means a reduction in grazing, ranching, and farms, anti-poverty, sustain sustainable development, payment for an ecosystem service program. Wyoming must become more active in investment to induce federal government divestment. We must have an overall land use plan that includes litigation, legislation, and education to our landowners. The purpose of House Bill 267 was not for the state to grow as a landowner. The purpose is to no longer be a victim of federal control. House Bill 267, simply put, made Wyoming have the right of first refusal once a party entered into an agreement with the federal government. Wyoming could match that offer. Um, and it is important that the landowner have that right at the end to choose who they would, who would they, they would sell to. But with an overall land use plan, we must limit acquisition and enhance exchanges and, and divestment by the federal government. We can keep control from transferring to the conservation groups. We can maximize mineral opportunities. We can move towards access of public lands, protect military installation from foreign governments, protect grazing and livestock, minimize or maximize energy production and transportation, transmission. We can stop early closures and monopolies regulated by the government. So this went before the Appropriations Committee and they actually uh, tabled the bill and looked for a committee. They were very interested in the idea, but they looked for a committee that could take this on because at the time we had foreign government bills, um, we had grazing bills, we had access bills, we had all of these bills. And the idea was to put it all together under one committee to develop an overall land use plan that deals with preventing Wyoming from our mineral, mineral industry, our access, and, and the things that we need to be working on. So with that, I'll take questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Knapp, uh, if we had such a uh, statute of first right of refusal, if it was already enacted, and something similar to this ranch that you were talking about, 35,000 acres, we would have to come up with that kind of money. What, how much money would have that cost the state to, to purchase that ranch versus the federal government? Uh, just wondering what kind of money we need to set aside to be able to exercise a first right of first refusal. You know, it varies, and that was one of the um, other parts of the bills, is what we would draw from, what money we would draw from to do this. Um, one could be our, our Wildlife Conservation Trust, um, which is uh, pretty flush with with money and, and works towards those conservation type easements as well. Um, but I would suggest that that's part of the the solution for this committee too, is to is to look at where that would draw from, if if not a multitude of of accounts. Um, I looked up a couple a couple examples. The Diamond Ranch up for sale is 800 acres, but it's surrounded in the Shoshone National Forest on three sides by federal land, um, which actually makes it more expensive. Um, that's 71 million. Uh, Kanye West has his, has his up for sale, 9,000 acres. However, 5,000 of those acres are leased back to the federal government. So it would depend on um, a state by a state, I would say. 
of what makes sense, which which falls back to Wyoming needs to have a more controlled land use plan, an overall land use plan, because uh, similar to the Occidental sale, um, just opportunities where we can trade with the federal government for land in, in let's say, land that's surrounded by uh, federal forest already for mineral rights in the Powder River Basin. Um, this is the type of, of logic that I used with, with the bill, and hopefully that can cover a lot of different areas and a lot of different bills. Mr. Chairman, I, I'm curious to know, sorry about that, Representative Knapp, how would you respond to this? Um, you have a landowner who really enjoys national forests and they want their land, you know, maybe it's adjacent to one and they really believe strongly that their land should be part of that system. Um, and maybe they've had horrible interactions with Wyoming Game and Fish, Office of State Lands, whoever. And they're, for whatever reason, they don't love the state of Wyoming, but they really believe in having the, their lands added to like a national park or a, a federal system. And so how do we justify that landowner and their rights to sell who, to whoever in, in any other context, they can sell it to whoever they want to. Um, I'm just worried about <laughs> us assuming that we're always better when maybe the landowner <laughs> with their private property rights say, yeah, I disagree with you. But now, now the state of Wyoming is telling them, no, no, we're better. So, I mean, then are we guilty of doing the very thing that we dislike so often <laughs> from the federal side? How would you respond? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator Ellis, I, I agree with you. Uh, this in no way is a taking. Um, the landowner would still reserve that right if they believe that their their land should go with the federal government. It just gives us the opportunity to match the offer or actually enhance the offer. Or if a, if a person actually wanted to sell to the state and negotiate a lower offer, they could. But ultimately, that landowner's rights are paramount and the state of Wyoming would not be involved in a taking. Follow up. Not saying a taking, saying, you know, maybe the state of Wyoming will negotiate a better rate or a better offer. The, you know, the Forest Service says, we'll give you 2 million and the state of Wyoming's like, no, we really want this. We'll give you 2.5. But the landowner's like, yeah, I'm free to choose who I sell this land to. Wyoming, no, even though you're asking for more, you'll pay me more. I don't like you, Wyoming. I want this to be part of the Forest Service system. That's the part that this doesn't allow that flexibility as I read the language. Representative. Of the, of the current bill, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. And go, may refer, what, you repeat the bill number that we're referring to. Uh, 267, okay. Mr. Chairman, cool. House bill. Go ahead. As the, as the bill reads currently, absolutely, that's what you would read into it. Um, this was part of the um, pullback and tabling of the bill was to put put in the assurance that a landowner would have that right, um, ultimately in the end to choose whether they wanted to sell to the federal government or to the state government um, in that instance. And just real follow up to understand also, is there other elements of this broader discussion being been assigned to other committees? You mentioned you know, foreign ownership of land um, or is this or what, what, what's the committee assignment for the interim based off your understanding? Are we focused on this one and other committees are focused on other elements or what, what is it? Mr. Chairman, yes. Um, they felt that this committee would be the appropriate committee to handle this. Um, AG was mentioned as well. Um, and uh, of course it involves going back to appropriations um, for the funding source, but um, just as an initial um, look at this concept. This committee was the one that was selected. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Representative Knapp, after uh, you've been here most of the day, and uh, I'm just sitting here and they're all on board of, of running an efficient BLM, but they're handcuffed by our federal government. So my point is, is, you know, we can go here and we can look at the, uh, the Forest Service you know, they can't manage the forest. Uh, we go to the, the chickens. We go to the horses. We can't manage the horses because they're all handcuffed by some reason from the federal government. So I guess my question is, are you just trying to, with this bill, basically allow Wyoming to bring Wyoming lands back to Wyoming 
so we can locally have more control over our state versus giving an option to go back to the BLM, which they're already handcuffed. They're having difficulties managing what they've got. Mr. Chairman, Representative Tarver, that is correct. I feel like Wyoming needs to start controlling its own destiny. It feels like we've been a victim for much too long when it comes to mineral development, when it comes to um, not litigating at times that we, we maybe should. Um, and we've just kind of sat back and, and let our destiny fall into the hands of, of someone else. So when the federal government says, now we're going to go and take more land, we want more conservation. And we've heard from testimony today that that, that uh, management may even fall to a conservation group. Now, I find it odd that uh, Bill Gates is becoming one of the largest landowners in the U.S. for agriculture, and at the same time funds conservation groups that wish to shut down ag use. Uh, so I, I think it's very important that Wyoming take a look at its future and say, if we're going to continue to be a leader in producing minerals, producing energy, um, having a, a robust ag program, um, looking at access for hunters, that we need to to take an overall look at the way that we manage our lands and try to control it from a Wyoming aspect versus allowing the federal government to, to continue to add to its roles. Discussion from Senator Cole. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so Representative Knapp, I'm trying to understand this bill on who's gonna manage this or, or is it gonna be this, I mean, I. I assume I haven't had a chance to look at other statute up, but uh, is this going to be managed in the same manner as other state lands in the state of Wyoming if, if there's a purchase uh, that happens under this proposed bill? Mr. Chairman, Senator, uh, yes, the, the way it is managed now, and, and I would include that the idea is not for Wyoming to hold lands. Um, I think that once, once it fits into a certain um, piece of the puzzle, so to speak, for land use, that Wyoming immediately lease or do with that that piece of land what it should, whether it's an exchange with the federal government for something elsewhere in the state that that fits into that puzzle, or where whether it's uh, leasing back to the federal government or whether it's actually leasing to our own constituency. Um, I don't I don't intend for this to cause uh, lands to be held by Wyoming for a, a long period of time. Um, we don't want to become the federal government either to, to uh, folks in Wyoming. And so I'm just trying to put it where it makes sense versus a piecemeal here and there. And, and you see it in legislators um, every year. We have bills that come that deal with one specific piece of this or one other piece of this over here. It's never an overall concept of what are we doing with our lands? What are we doing with our access, our minerals? Um, and, and where the federal government probably makes more sense to have conservation easements versus looking for themselves where they would like them. Follow up. Well, on the note of the state managing these things, I mean, you obviously realize that people are opposed to the state managing what they manage. And I'll just give you one example, overnight camping. Okay, the state doesn't allow it on state lands. So, I mean, there's a bunch of people that uh, feel like that's not a multiple use, right? So, frankly, I think my two cents on this is, is we got to tackle that problem, that we don't have uh, the our multiple use isn't as good as the federal government's multiple use uh, in many cases. So, I think there's an issue with uh, the in my mind it raises a question about is this really the right place for us to expand more Wyoming control in a way that I don't think fits Wyoming well as, as multiple use might go. So that's my concern about any legislation such as this. Representative, thank you. Mr. Mr. Chairman, if you want. Yes, Senator Kolb, I, I would agree with you. I, I feel that those are Wyoming problems, right? And, and the more that Wyoming can control and solve those issues, um, 
through legislation, through laws, or through the agencies. At least that puts it in our court. Um, I don't want to see continued growth of of federal lands uh, through whatever program they want to call it, um, beautifying America or or increasing federal control over over state lands. Um, so I would I would agree with you if there's if there's issues like that that are Wyoming controlled, that certainly we can have a part in solving those. Further questions? Yeah. Mr. Chairman, I, I just have some concerns about the infringement of private property rights on this. Um, you know, recently was visiting with some really difficult decision to sell their ranch. Their family was super cash strapped. Um, and you mentioned the Occidental land purchase. When I watched the state of Wyoming, we had a wonderful opportunity to be involved in that. And we didn't get it because we're the Wyoming and we wanted more review, more legislative oversight, blah, blah. We lost it. And so when I hear government inserting itself into this, it's more time consuming. And so I am concerned about a landowner who is looking for whatever reason to make a sale, make a deal. Maybe they need those funds right away and they've got a willing partner with a federal. I'm nervous about inserting ourselves with 30 day processes for matches and this and that. Um, I, I just, I think the intention's good, but I, I worry that we're we're Wyoming and we're just gonna make it worse. And I, I don't know if you've never expressed that concern to you. Sorry. Mr. Chairman, Senator Ellis, um, keep in mind that I'm not promoting this particular bill. This was a starting point to start the conversation. Um, if this does go forward in another in another bill, it obviously will give that landowner the ultimate right in what they do with their property. Um, the time prescriptions as well. Um, my basis is that as the federal government throughout the western states is vying for more land from private um, people, that Wyoming at least have the opportunity to offer our citizens the capability to control it in Wyoming first. Um, that is the reason for the bill. Um, and again, this one I knew wasn't, wasn't really going anywhere which is why it was tabled and brought to the committee to to expound on that and and maybe come up with something that is that is beneficial. Other questions for the representative. Okay, thank you, sir, for coming all the way down. Thank and, you. Uh, stand by, don't go too far. So, uh, next up we have state lands. Sorry for the delay, Mr. Crowder, but uh, probably could predict that representative Napa would have been here. So. Mr. Chairman, again, it's Jason Crowder, uh, Deputy Director for the Office of State Lands and Investments. Director Scoggin apologizes for not being here, and I'm going to apologize for you having the B team, but I'm happy to answer any questions related to federal land exchanges with the state. Um, as I understood it, you wanted to talk more about House Bill uh, that you were just speaking about. I'm happy to do that as well. Um, and since Director Scoggin's not here, I think I can tell you and, and suffer the impacts when I get home, but this was my favorite bill going into the session. Um, it allowed the, the Board of Land Commissioners in the office to pick all of the out of all the transactions its very best and, and to move forward with it if it wanted to. And it also had a continuous appropriation tied to it. So we had the open checkbook to continue as we wanted to. Um, uh, I'm saying that in jest. Uh, all, obviously, all of the issues that were just discussed here um, were issues that we discussed through the um, through the session as we process this bill going forward. Uh, there are a lot of ways to make the bill better. Um, you all have talked about a lot of those, and and so has Representative Knapp. And if another bill comes forward and puts the state in some type of position to um, talk about negotiating to be the the entity that does the acquisition instead of the federal government we're happy to to help in those and and offer more positive solutions to make a good bill better um, but at the end of the day it's important to know that we have some limitations um, as far as state land transactions and the largest limitation is funding and so i i may say in jest that we had an open checkbook but it's true uh, right now we can only buy land with funds that we currently have available in the permanent land fund. And that balance right now is just about $5 million for private land transactions. Of course, that's much higher for federal land transactions after we've gone through the federal um, or the uh, Teton 
County uh, Teton National Park disposals. But $5 million doesn't go very far, um, as was discussed earlier. So if we were to, to put ourselves in a position, there would need to be some type of funding structure put in place that we could easily grab and move forward with. Um, the reason we're limited on cash to buy land is that it's an investment for the state. All state trust lands are not public land. Uh, they're not managed for the same management philosophy as the federal government. We're here to generate revenue for specific beneficiaries. Obviously, the largest one is the K through 12 school system. So any funds that we put into a land acquisition uh, need to have a, a rate of return, an expected return on that investment. Um, so we use those permanent land funds because that is their intent is to generate a return for those beneficiaries. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I may stop there and, and answer any questions. Well, I'll, I'll offer one more thing. Our real estate program is always open for business. Uh, it is never not open for business and we're only limited by the funding that's available for acquisitions and the staff capacity that we have in house. But when an individual is looking to dispose their property, they can do that to whoever they want. That's absolutely correct, including us. Um, they can approach us at any time and we can start that process and work it for them. It's important to know we're going to do that analysis for uh, return on investment and, and not for a conservation measure or anything like that. It's, it's going to be monetary either today or through an investment in the future. So, Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to answer any more questions. I don't want to get into too much detail just, you know, because we haven't, you know, this is how we're going to move forward with the bill draft. But I guess what you said at the end there where, you know, if we have this mechanism where you come in and match the federal offer and it might be forced to acquire that asset at, at the price of which has not been negotiated by state lands, that return on investment could be very poor. Is that? Mr. Chairman, that's correct. And, and you'll notice we don't do a lot of acquisitions for that very reason. We currently hold 3.4 million surface acres and 3.9 million surface acres. And all of that came free of charge. You have an acquisition cost on top of that, the rate of return drops significantly. Absolutely. Chairman, so living in a, a capitalistic culture that we have, we, we look at that ROI, the return of invest, investment, and we look at short-term returns on our investment because we want it in our generation. Uh, we want it within five or 10 years to, to pay back. The advantage of a, of a state ownership is that you can look multi-generational. Uh, that's why some of these foreign ownerships are so so attractive to other governments because they are looking at 50 to 100 year payback versus five or 10 that we look at here as, as private citizens. But still, with the, the money of the state, you have to look at the other opportunities with that money, what you can generate, because ultimately you want a, a, a higher ROI. Uh, so... To have a, a, a ranch of 35,000 acres that's offered to us for a first right of refusal that's multi-millions of dollars, that we can only uh, lease it for grazing afterwards, that's going to be hard to show even a positive ROI. So, you know, conceptually, this is a great idea to, to, to limit the ownership of federal uh, lands within the state, but I, I, I also see it difficult for us as a state and the investment board to make a decision, yes, we're gonna spend $50 million for this ranch. It's only gonna generate, you know, a few thousand dollars a year in grazing. So uh, how, when you look at ROI, is it, do you compare what you could make through the investment market with your money or do you look at a, a 50 year payback? What, what kind of gauge of, of KP, Mr. Crowder? Mr. Chairman, Mr. Co-Chair, uh, great questions. And we look at all of those. Uh, so the, the state land trust has been in place for 133 years, and hopefully we do that for another 133. But also part of the board's trust land management objectives, which it developed in 2005, speak to short and long-term investment benefits back to its beneficiaries. So we are looking for that immediate, very short-term cash um, uh, back to the beneficiaries that they can utilize right now. We also look at the long-term investment. Um, what are property that could generate lease rates higher than what we currently have? Or um, as was mentioned before, uh, how much 
potential does the property have to appreciate that if we were to exchange it or sell it, that it gives the state a, a greater benefit at that time. Those are uh, also, we have to beat whatever the treasurer's office is doing with the funds that he invests. And that is part of the analysis too. So if we can't beat that, then it's highly likely that that, uh, that opportunity improve. State lands. Okay, Senator Cole. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I mean, we've had in the past discussions uh, about issues with your department uh, division. And here we're talking about expanding it or taking on more uh, land to manage. In your opinion, are there other areas that we need to clean up first before we go running off and frankly making a bigger problem than we currently have? help your office do what it does uh, maybe more efficiently and address some of the problems you've heard in the last year or two, at least. Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Colvin, and thanks for bringing up the issues that we talked about. I appreciate responding to those again. And, and some of those are staffing within the office, the, the higher viable on state. Some of it is how the legislature has enacted processes for management and use of state lands in a variety of different arenas. I think we're doing great things uh, with your help as far as staffing. Uh, we were able to secure, I believe, four, four to five new positions in the last session um, to help with our responsiveness to industry and to citizens utilizing state lands, and, and that'll help. Um, you should know that we're coming again to say that was a good first step. Here's the second step and, and the benefits that come from that. Um, and also we're working with our oversight committee, the joint ag committee on relieving some of those um, very prescriptive pressures on the uses of state land to make that more and more responsive to the times that we currently live it's like that and people don't miss deadlines. So um, knowing that more transactions can come into the office they would be subject to those pressures that you just mentioned and, and I just discussed. It's also important to know that the um, uh, uh, legislature has given us guidance as far as a no net gain of state land ownership within the state. Um, they gave us a baseline uh, created back in 1999 that we are not to go above 10,000 acres of that baseline or below 10,000 acres of the baseline. Currently, we set 3,300 acres of the below that baseline. That was guidance given to us in a budget footnote. It's obviously expired, but it's something that the board wants to know each and every time we look at a land transaction and its impact to the total ownership across the state. So the board does that without legislative direction just to ensure that our ownership doesn't exceed 10,000 acres above that baseline. I would anticipate that anything that would come out of an effort like this, even if it was 35,000 acres, that we would immediately turn around and try to divest ourselves of acreage that would bring us back closer to that baseline or within that 10,000 acre no net gain. Questions, committee? Okay, thank you, Mr. Carter. appreciate it. Okay, any public comment on this issue? Land exchanges, both state and federal. Okay, anybody online? Okay, public comment is closed. Committee, any discussion or motions on this topic? Chairman, uh, whereas we're the only committee that's been assigned this as an interim topic, uh, I make a motion that we bring House Bill 267 back for a further discussion next time we meet and get some input from various organizations, some, some uh, input, what we can do to mark that bill draft up to make it more palatable and improve upon it and maybe come up with a, a solution that will be beneficial for all. Okay, any discussion on the motion? Okay, sure, second, anybody? Okay, Representative Tarver, any discussion? Senator Cole. Mr. Chairman, initially I'm opposed to the bill, uh, but I'm certainly willing to discuss it uh, for, uh, it's fine under a final judgment. But I, I, the concept, I think, needs a lot of refinement. Kind of work. We've got to we've got to work pretty hard on it. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any further discussion, committee? Okay. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, say no. Okay, that motion carries. We always uh, have a bill draft before us, and I agree it does need quite a bit of work. So. We'll see you in a little bit, Mayor Representative Knapp. So. Okay, so final subject here. We have uranium production on federal lands. Uh, come on back up. <laughs> you guys, whoever wants to come on down. Um, and yeah, here we go. And we do have some online uh, public comment, uh, but obviously something I think that's become increasingly obvious and I'm pretty biased, you know, um, uh, you know, I, I used, to, used to have a very large uranium mine in my district and uh, um, something I think is going to be vital for our future in, in this country and in the state, but I want to learn a little bit about how uranium production occurs on federal lands, because uh, that's an important piece of the pie. So uh, welcome back for your last bite at the apple here. Uh, feel free to proceed. Mr. Chairman. So uranium production on federal lands in Wyoming, first I'll start out with our general mining law program. There are currently 37,763 mining claims across the state. Over the last 18 months, we have received just over 7,000 new mining claims. While claimants are not required to provide the mineral they're seeking, the claimants who have shared such information indicate the commodities for these claims include gold, which is about 75%, and rare earth elements, about 24%, and the remainder are uranium and bentonite. So the current status of uranium in Wyoming, there are 19 BLM authorized mine plans and five acknowledged notice level explora exploration operations for uranium across the state. Uranium is a locatable min mineral and the BLM does not track production from individual operations per the mining law. However, BLM Wyoming is not aware of any uranium production in the state in 2022. Uranium production has mostly ceased and claimants have continued care and maintenance management and environmental compliance activities with the intent of returning the mines to an active status when the commodity prices increase. While all uranium producing operations are in care and maintenance, the reclamation bonding situation remains largely unchanged. All operations are fully bonded under the 43 CFR 3809 requirements. Statewide, the total bond for all 3809 related actions is nearly 295 million, with a total obligated holding amount of 352 million. Uranium bonds account for 85% of bonds held. And we'll take questions now, and I will defer most of them to Mr. Spencer. Questions on uranium mining? Go ahead, and Senator. Hold. Real quick one. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, Lost Creek is not in production anymore is that i hear you right i thought you said there was no active maybe i just heard you wrong uh, what are what active mine of uranium mines uh, in situ or whatever it may be in the state of wyoming are currently in production senator cole our our 19 authorized mine plans i believe are all currently in shut-in status in, in their maintenance mode Representative. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Spencer, we uh, as a United States kind of got caught in the situation with uh, Ukraine and Russia. We let our uranium mining lag and, uh, and come to a screeching halt as we found the commodity cheaper on the international market. And now we find that we don't have enough uranium source material or enrichment material to be able to supply our own needs. And, and we kind of were short-sighted in that respect. So in my personal opinion, I believe we're gonna see a revamp of our uranium mining industry and uh, enrichment in the, in the next few years. So as uranium is not, not only in Wyoming, there's other places within the United States where it's available. What do you feel, in, in your opinion, Mr. Spencer, what can we do in Wyoming to spur the growth of uranium mining here rather than in one of these other states. Uh, Representative Heiner, I think I think Wyoming is well poised to deal with any with any new applications. As, as I recall, the state got uh, primacy over certain actions from the Department of Energy, and that that's really streamlined the issues. We have a, a great memorandum of understanding with the Wyoming Department of Environmental Quality on how we address uranium and hard rock 
hard rock mining in, in general on how we do it, what the BLM role is versus what the state role is. And I feel like it's really poised once we get an application come in. So I, I feel like we're in a pretty good shape if, if they come in. Other questions, committee? Okay. Appreciate that status update. Sorry to hear that everything's shut in, but that's unfortunately all, all too common across state, federal, private property. So um, hopefully it'll change someday. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Next up online, we um, have the CEO of uh, Peninsula Energy. Um, so if we let him in. Um, <clears throat> Welcome, sir. Please feel free to introduce yourself and uh, proceed with your testimony. My name is Wayne Hiley, and I am a member. I am the CEO uh, of Peninsula Energy, which is a publicly traded company holding uranium mining interests in the state of Wyoming via our wholly owned subsidiary, Strata Energy. I live in Casper, and I have made Wyoming my home for most of my adult life. Uh, I'm appearing via, uh, before you. Uh, and your committee at the recommendation of Mr. Travis Detai, uh, the executive director of the Wyoming Mining Association, who was unable to attend today's meeting. So uh, a word about the Mining Association. It's a statewide trade organization that represents uh, and advocates for 33 mining companies, members um, producing bentonite, coal, trona, uranium, lignite, as well as uh, companies that are developing gold and rare earth deposits. The WMA also represents over 100 associate member companies, and uh, one electric co-op and one advanced nuclear power company. So it's my pleasure to be with you today uh, to update you on the status of your uranium recovery industry in Wyoming and some federal issues that we're encountering as we ramp up. Uh, the state of Wyoming is currently home to six permitted and operational uranium mines. Uh, Stratus Lance Project, UR Energy's Lost Creek Mine, Chemico Smith Ranch uh, and North Butte Mines, Energy Fuels Nickel Ranch, and uh, Uranium Energy Corporation's Willow Creek Mines. We also have one conventional mill in standby mode, the Sweetwater Mill in Sweetwater County. In addition to the permitted and operational mines, there are several projects that are currently being permitted, have applied for expansions, or have been approved but not constructed. There are also a number of companies actively exploring for new deposits in the state. So um, you heard um, statewide uranium production in 2022 last year was negligible at 33,000 pounds. Uh, this is down from about 4.3 million pounds per year a decade ago and about 12 million pounds per year in the late 1970s when uranium's, uh, your, uh, uranium production peaked in the state of Wyoming. The state hosts an estimated total resource of over 450 million pounds. Uh, so we're very sizable and an important state uh, for uranium productions. Wyoming, company, Wyoming companies are permitted and licensed to produce about 13 million pounds annually um, via our in situ and conventional methods. This is an important share of our nation's uranium production capacity uh, nationally, our, our commercial nuclear reactor fleet consumes 40 to 50 million pounds a year. So even if we were producing um, at our full capacity, we wouldn't meet our nation's um, requirements for uranium. At a recent re uh, uh, research and explorations for nuclear energy in Wyoming uh, workshop held by the U UW School of Energy Resources, the director of the nuclear fuel cycle at Idaho National Labs noted though, Wyoming does indeed have the capacity uh, to supply the necessary amounts of uranium needed in particular, if we were to pursue uh, building the domestic high assay low enriched uranium um, needed uh, to fuel the small modular reactors of the future, like the TerraPower demonstration project in Kemmerer. Uh, the Wyoming industry has employed 142 people at the end of, of last year with a payroll of about $14 million. And um, that's up 20 employees from the previous year, but down from the 500 where we were 
in um, 2013 and about 5,300 in the late 1970s. The industry uh, has generated an estimated 600,000 in revenues and taxes and royalties last year. Severance tax is the main uh, source and severance tax for uranium is currently um, set on a sliding scale base on a, on a price, uh, less than $30 price. We, there's no, uh, no severance tax. Uh, at $60 or more, there's a 5% uh, severance tax. The current price, uh, the spot price for uranium uh, today is in the mid 50s and the severance tax base rate, therefore uh, I expect is about 4%. The sliding scale that I just talked about expires unless it's expanded, extended at the end of 2026. And at that time, if it, if it does expire, uh, the severance tax rate will revert to a flat 4% rate. Okay, so here's the good news. Um, while, while the economics of each company are different, um, uranium prices have been improving over the past two years. And uh, we now have reached a point where at least two companies are working to resume production in the state. This month, UR Energy announced the resumption of production activities at, Lost, uh, at the Lost Creek Mine in Sweetwater County. Senator Kolb, uh, UR Energy is producing today. Uh, Strata Energy, the company I represent, also has guided that it will resume production around mid-year um, at the Lance Projects in Crook County. So Wyoming operators are actively hiring and looking to add, uh, I estimate about 150 jobs as production resumes around the state. These jobs range from field operators, engineers, geologists, drillers, lab techs, mechanics, electricians, uh, field construction folks, maintenance folks, small equipment operators, plant operators, administrative staff. Uh, it's the full gamut that's required to operate a mine. These are all high paying jobs and depending on the position, uh, the salary expectations would be between $50,000 and $135,000 per year. There's also a notable increase in exploration drilling activities uh, currently. Several junior exploration companies have staked land positions within the state and are actively investing in, in locating new uranium mineral deposits. If prices remain strong like they are today, it's likely that exploration activities alone could add another 150 to 200 jobs in the state. The companies that are actively ramping up activities are facing headwinds, challenging headwinds related to cost inflation, a tight labor market, construction, operating supply availabilities, uh, transportation costs, limited contractor availability, and federal policy issues. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm just here to tell you, it's tough out there, and it's nothing like business as usual uh, once looked. So before I touch on federal issues, I want to say that the industry has a very good working relationship with the state of Wyoming, uh, uh, Department of Environmental Quality Uranium Recovery Program. Wyoming's agreement state program with the NRC grants the state regulatory, uh, regulatory primacy over uranium recovery, and this has proven to be very successful. It's an example of where bringing it home to Wyoming has been a, a benefit to the industry that it was intended to benefit. It has cut permitting times for us and permitting costs for us, and the state uh, agency, the, the uranium recovery program, appears to be delivering on a far more efficient program um, than the Nuclear Regulatory Commission ever did. So on to the, the federal um, questions. Under the General Mining Act of 1872, uranium is a locatable mineral um, and it's managed as such, which means on federal lands and over federal mineral rights, companies stake and maintain federal mineral claims that establish the right to locate and recover uranium. The system dif differs from oil, coal, and gas, which are managed under leasing systems. Unlike leased minerals, mineral claims under the locatable mineral systems must be renewed every year by payment of an annual fee. Without exception, the uranium projects in Wyoming include uh, rights established via federal mineral claims. Every uranium mine that I'm aware of has federal mineral claims on it. Uh, those claims are managed by the BLM. In many of the projects, 
uh, absolutely include a blend of private, state, and federal mineral rights. On surface ownership, you also have a mix of federal, state, and private ownership. Uranium operations therefore must establish surface and mineral leases with a variety of owners and interests. To my knowledge, there's only one um, project that's exclusively on federal and, and uh, mineral and federal surface, and that's uh, the Lost Creek project. Although there may be one or two state lease sections within the Lost Creek project. When federal surface ownership is incorporated into a mine plan area, NEPA reviews are invoked by federal mandate. Historically, um, the industry's interaction with the BLM on NEPA has proven to be difficult. Specifically, the BLM has not interacted and cooperated well with other federal agencies in the past in the preparation of the required NEPA interviews. Because of this, the BLM uh, <clears throat> has, has it ended up conducting their own NEPA reviews, costing the industry millions of dollars and years of delay. One project developer actually removed a fully surrounded section of federal surface from their proposed license area in order to speed up the licensing process. Consequently, the federal minerals in that section will never be developed or recovered. Today, industry's uh, larger concerns are really two issues um, at the BLM level. First, the BLM seems to be overreaching regarding sage-grouse core area protections or sage-grouse protections. The state already has an exemplary program for, of protections for the sage-grouse. However, if the BLM institutes its own program, as was discussed earlier in your meeting, uh, and continues on its current current path, this may greatly hinder the uranium recovery operations in the state, which all have BLM minerals involved. Second, the BLM is currently seeking comments on the, uh, the 2023 proposed public lands rule. The 2023 rule package places a strong emphasis on public land conservation, avoidance and mitigation of ecosystem impairments, and an increased effort, uh, emphasis on restoration and inclusion of restoration plans in the regional management plans. Uh, the prioritization of, of conservation use over multiple use becomes a de facto withdrawal of lands from the uses such as mineral extraction. Federally, there is also concerns with the EPA efforts to regulate groundwater associated with uranium recovery. There was a significant effort in, by the EPA in 2015 to tighten groundwater restoration standards, which posed an existential threat to the in-situ uranium recovery industry. Uh, since the costs of implementing the proposed standards would have been too much for the industry to bear. Uh, the proposed rule fortunately was withdrawn in 2017, but there have been discussions within the current administration about reviving this proposal. We're watching that very closely. Uh, federal environmental policy is also adversely affecting the uranium industry in indirect ways. Uh, the example I bring to you is cement. We use cement for well installations and it's become very difficult to obtain. Uh, one operator noted that cement type, the cement type they require will soon no longer be manufactured in the United States due to new EPA regulations centered around the cement manufacturer's car carbon emissions. An alternative cement has not yet been identified. Finally, the uranium industry has concerns with efforts in Congress to reopen and revise the general mining law of 1875, which is our foundational law. Uh, the specific intent here is, is our objective of, of, implement, uh, of the revisions is to implement a federal royalty system on locatable minerals. Currently only leasable minerals are subject to federal royalties. Uh, the owners of locatable, locatable mineral rights invest their own capital for the chance to locate and develop uh, a mineral deposit benefiting many stakeholders across our society. The imposition of a royalty a 12 to 16% royalty, or even a more modest royalty, which can later be revisited, uh, will substantially weaken 
the competitiveness of our domestic uranium production industry. So in closing, I'd like to submit to the committee that while many external factors remain challenging, there's a great amount of optimism in the industry today. The challenges we face are not insurmountable and, and uh, there, there's a forward movement with the uranium industry now re revitalizing and restarting operations around the state. It's, a, it's a, a great new day for the industry in that regard. We appreciate the support we get from this committee and the full legislation and from Governor Gordon and his team. Uh, as the interest in nuclear power in the United States grows and in Wyoming in particular, the future looks bright for this industry. So with that, I'll stand for, for questions. Any questions, committee? Senator Kolb. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a question about, I don't know if you know the history or if you could answer this question, but Bechtel um, in years past was demilling weapons grade uranium and uh, then reselling it on the open market. And that in fact depressed the uranium market. Has that practice ceased, uh, do you know, uh, just what the status of, I guess, what that past activity was currently? Uh, Mr. Chairman, yeah, uh, Senator Kolb, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, the uranium industry was facing the headwind of the U.S. government having uh, dismantled uh, or, or a program of dismantling weapons and, and returning uranium into the market. Uh, that program has, uh, that was called the, uh, what was it? Uh, megawatts to megaton or megatons to megawatts program and that, that program has ceased. Um, it's no longer a headwind in the industry. Any further questions committee? Okay, I just have one really quick. I mean, you mentioned um, some of the challenges with the, the federal government. There's other things that the state can do to talk about severance tax, but I think that's a little bit different um, you know, committee perhaps, but is there anything specifically the state of Wyoming should be doing to uh, support your industry as it relates to the, the federal nexus? Yeah, I uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think the, the state of Wyoming needs to employ its expertise in the uranium recovery and natural resources management to um, to comment on, on the, the Bureau of Land Management's uh, 2023 um, um, uh, plan uh, to make sure that, that the provisions of, of that uh, plan are not onerous to, to its extraction industry. It would go beyond the uranium industry. Um, if, if, uh, if the changes that we see um, coming um, were implemented, again, I, I'd, I'd like to emphasize that, you know, my view of of the um, of the of this uh, uh, public lands rule is is that it, it's it's emphasizing conf conservation uh, over all other uses, and and mining needs to exist in a multi-use environment. Okay, thanks. For that I think we're we're on the ball on that one. Hopefully, we'll see what we can do there. So, any further questions, committee? Miracle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll figure out where to put my face with this microphone. Uh, when it comes to the production of uh, uh, the terminology HALO for the uh, reactor systems that we're talking about coming into the state of Wyoming, uh, do we have to produce a certain kind of uranium to do that? Or is it a process of refining the said uranium that produces the HALO product? Do you know anything about that, uh, sir? Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, Se Senator, I, I know enough to be dangerous. Uh, every, uh, every bit of uranium that can be produced in the state of Wyoming can be utilized to generate HALU. Um, we, we produce a uranium concentration uh, that goes through uh, further refinement steps in the nuclear fuel cycle. Uh, the next step in the line is conversion to a uranium hexafluoride. And then that hexafluoride uh, gas goes through um, an isotopic um, a separation process that is separating different uranium isotopes, and that's what's called enrichment. HALU, high assay, low enriched uranium, is, is enriched to a concentration uh, approaching 20% of the uranium isotope of interest. 
uh, as opposed to the fuel that we use for our commercial fleet right now, which is which is about five percent. But but the uranium itself, um, you know, the origin of the uranium wouldn't matter. Um, the Wyoming, Wyoming's uranium can be used to generate HALU uh, or other nuclear fuels. Um, it's just a matter of the downstream processes uh, that are employed. Any further questions, committee? Okay, thank you, sir, uh, for your time. Appreciate it. And good to see you. My pleasure. Any thank you. Any further public comment on this? Yep. Any public comment on this final topic? Okay, anybody online? Okay, that being said, public comment is closed, committee. Um, any further discussion on this topic? Okay, uh, Chairman, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, recognizing that this sliding scale severance tax is, is getting close to expiration in 2026, uh, not knowing what the tax structure will be in three years or four years from now, three years from now, uh, I don't know if that's an impediment or not for, for industry, but the uncertainty is, all, is always difficult. Now, that may be a topic that's better addressed by the Revenue Committee than through our committee. So uh, I don't know if we should mention that to our revenue committee as a, as a possible uh, topic or whether we should introduce something ourselves. Mr. Chair, I think the requirement for this committee is that it has to have some sort of direct federal nexus, which is why with the previous uh, House Bill 163, there's a direct correlation to the federal royalty rate. So there is that nexus there. I don't think there's a nexus here because it's just, you know, uh, our state policy, what the severance tax is, not untethered from what the federal government may be doing. And it seems like it's a completely different environment than oil and gas right now um, in terms of federal policy. But um, certainly, I, I'm, that was my bill that established that. So I'm, I'd love to get rid of that um, sunset day at some point. So as individual legislators, yeah, I think it's about that time to start talking about doing that, whether you know that extra 5% level is really all that appropriate. But um, that's what it took to get through the House years ago. Um, we'll, we'll, maybe that hasn't changed much, but we can definitely look at the, the sunset date for sure. So, okay, committee. Um, looks like we're at the end of our agenda. Um, I, I get the impression we only have one more authorized meeting. I, I, I want the committee's input, but I, I'm leaning towards asking Management Council for another day. I think we. We've got a lot on our plate and a lot more that we could be doing. And we've got what uh, several bill drafts are going to take, I think, a little bit of work. Um, and so if it's okay with the committee, I'd certainly want to get your input on that. But it looks like we might have uh, two more meetings instead of just one. But I want to see if anybody has any comment on that. Mr. Chairman, go ahead. Our next scheduled or tentatively scheduled meeting is September 13th. So I just wanted everyone to be aware of that. Is that right, Talise, Emily? I think it's in October. Is it October? Yeah. Okay. If we do go to two meetings, we might end up having to have different dates because I don't think that really works all that well for having <laughs> two. You know, we have to have our third meeting in December or something like that, which we could do, I guess. But uh... Okay, so... Um, Absent any discussion, we'll go ahead and ask for a second meeting date, and just uh, as it stands right now, and uh, or a third, I guess, two more. Um, any other discussion? Okay, looks like we are adjourned. Thanks for the good work. We'll see you next time.